Hi, welcome to our April 23rd, 2021 Club Cubase uh, live stream. Uh, we'll get started in just a couple minutes. I'm going to do a quick test of audio and uh, be right back. We'll just make sure everything's coming through. Okay. Okay, so audio sounds fine. My name is Greg Undo. I am the host for the live stream today. If you have not attended a live stream before, how it works is you could submit questions in the live chat field, <clears throat> excuse me, or send questions in advance to clubcubase at steinberg.de. Um, we used to, as you ask questions, uh, the ability for people to ask questions can far exceed my ability to answer them in real time. So as you ask a question, um, realize that it may take me a little while to get to it, especially later in the live stream. So if we could try to avoid maybe repeating the same question, because that will just kind of slow down uh, the entire process of me being able to get through as many questions. So if we could try to that. And when you ask a question, if we could specify which version of Cubase, which operating system you're on. So you could say I'm running Cubase Elements, uh, 10.5 on Mac OS or Cubase Pro on, you know, Cubase Pro 11 on Windows. That information is often helpful. So if you let us know which version of Cubase you're running. Um, so, you know, I'm, I work for Yamaha Corporation of America as a product specialist, uh, primarily focusing on Steinberg products. And, you know, so I'm presenting from outside of Washington, D.C. in Alexandria, Virginia. And if you want to, if you're watching the live stream, if you want to go ahead and uh, simply tell us who you are and where you're from, that'd be wonderful. I see some familiar names on the live stream uh, because next Friday's live stream will be the last live stream of the month. We will be doing a, uh, a the zoom meetup after the live stream. So we'll cut maybe about, we'll, we'll shorten the live stream to maybe about two hours and then we'll have the zoom meetup where everyone could kind of meet and talk to each other. And you could listen to someone else besides myself speak which is always helpful. Um, makes my last Friday of the month a little easier as well. But if we could try, you know, if you want a, an invitation, I have the Zoom uh, meeting uh, set up. So if you want an invitation, you could email me at clubcubase at steinberg.de and I'll be happy to share the Zoom meetup information. Uh, so in like many of you during kind of our pandemic, uh, my family is working from home, so I may get interrupted by my son or my wife or something. So I'll apologize in advance for that, but we'll try to go for about four hours today, depending on questions, but let's go ahead and see who's here. And if you're watching this, uh, on a replay, you may want to just skip ahead a couple minutes, but, uh, so we see Mark Rabin was checking in, but he can't make the live stream. All right, so we have Rio de Janeiro from uh, Moshi Marketing or Mashi Marketing. We have Filter Freak is doing uh, his 13th visit. So it's great. Robbie Bowling from Dallas, Texas. We have Michael Marshall from Somerset, England. All right, so we have Jazz Dude from Germany. I believe he's in Heidelberg area. We have Uno from Finland. All right. Okay, so we have Sable Winters. She's in San Francisco Bay Area in the United States. We have Cubase Index, which is a wonderful site. So if you uh, want to search for particular topics, you probably shortly, uh, at a few hours after the live stream, I'll go through and go through the live stream again and uh, type an index of all the topics with timestamps. But if you want to search for topics that have been covered in uh, Club Cubase live streams or Hangouts in the past, we can, you could go to cubaseindex.com and search there. Also another fantastic resource of information is the Cubase Nation Discord. And also, and Jazz Dude's very involved with that. So it's a great collection of information for Steinberg users. And also I'd like to thank Agent K. He usually does some moderation for us when needed. We usually have a well-behaved crowd, but Occasionally, someone gets in and tries to cause a little ruckus, so Agent K is always really helpful with that. All right, so we have Ken from Norway. We have Pablo Vasquez from 
He's from Galicia, España. Tim Weinheimer uh, from Mission Viejo. All right, so we have Pylon Records. All right, from Los Angeles. All right, we also have uh, John Costigan from Kenosha, Wisconsin. All right, so we have Philip from Serbia. Okay, so we have uh, Nigeria checking in. All right, we'll get started here in just a couple minutes. And if you know, if you want to, guys, go ahead and start asking questions. Okay. And all right, so we have Sub 403, I believe is in British Columbia. All right, we have Wasted Gamers from the Netherlands. Okay. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, so more people will be logging in. Um, Okay, so we just see from Filter Freak, uh, question, could you tell us why you don't show your Cubase performance meter? Is it the same reason as most of us it peaks into the red? Um, so I have no problem showing my performance meter. Uh, I usually don't have so much of a uh, performance concern. So let's say if I'm just playing my project here, and I'll open up my performance meter by hitting F12. So I can see my average and maximum load for pretty heavy song CPU wise. So. And that's with a number of different BST instruments. in multi-timbral use, so lots of different instruments that you see here. So yeah, I don't have any problems opening up my CPU meter. It's probably just not the most interesting thing to look at, So, but I don't try to hide it at all. Okay. And it's really kind of your performance meter, so. All right, so we have Stefan checking in from Sweden. Okay. Okay, going through. Comments and we're kind of going through some of the different introductions. All right, so we see Michael Pierce is here for the giveaway. So maybe we'll do it next uh, next week on the Zoom meetup. So I probably won't have any giveaway, but it'll be free knowledge. That's our giveaway today. All right, wonderful to see Taylor from Pine Grove, Pennsylvania. Okay, so a question from Taylor. Uh, Cubase 11 playback during cycle record is transposed, uh, but plays correctly when I take it out of record mode. Live transform and chord track are off. Uh, what am I missing? So if it's in kind of cycle, um, Okay, so it says uh, the, the live transform and chord track are off. What am I missing? So I would make sure, you know, so you can have kind of the input transformer, which could do some stuff like that. But if you go to two things that I would check is make sure that your MIDI modifiers here, that the transform or the transpose is doesn't have a value. Uh, during that, because that will kind of sound a transposition, but record the data in its actual uh, as played. So I would see that if that is set, that that would be kind of transposing uh, the incoming MIDI data without 
um, while keeping it at the same value. One other thing to also check is just to make sure like you don't have a transpose track in the project that could also uh, cause something that you see. Um, if you're transpose, if you're recording into an existing part, make sure that that part that you're recording into doesn't have transpose activated in the info line that we see here. So those are a couple of things that I would check. And I think one of those would kind of be the culprit. All right, so we have a uh, question one. Uh, can you please create some macro and show us useful issues regarding it? So I'll show one that we did uh, recently um, just so you can get a, kind of a sense of some of the capabilities of macros. And what a macro is, it is a series of key commands and you could hide the macros from your keyboard shortcuts or show macros. So if you want it to come and instead of doing the same function over and over again, um, we could just, you know, have a macro and have the macro itself actually, uh, you know, do particular functions. So let's say I want it to, let's see, I think we, I did one recently which was uh which was to and this is for Alex Morgan and he wanted uh an, the ability to delete muted events on selected tracks. So if I'm in a particular audio event here and I have a number of these events that are muted, so say we'll blow this up and I have different muted events there is a project logical editor preset that I created here. And this would be to, um, I created a preset here. And this is kind of a conditional Boolean based editor where we could say uh, delete selected and muted events. So, but this would do it on all of the tracks. So if I apply this, um, that could just delete the muted events that are selected on all of the tracks, but not on the selected track. So in this case, what I could do is just set up my macro and we'll show you how I made the macro. So what I've done is to create a macro. So, and it's, this one's just going to be two steps. So I'm going to do set up a condition, a function before the macro starts. And from that point, we're going to then create the project logical editor that I saved as a preset. So what I want to do is to, instead of going and edit, select all on the tracks and then process that project logical editor, instead of doing this or multiple steps of particular functions that you would do repeatedly over and over and over again, I could just come over here and say, okay, I want to select all of the events on this track. And that would include all the events would be selected and the tracks are muted. We could choose to delete. So now when I go to my macros and you could create your own keyboard shortcuts, uh, if I did everything right, we could say delete muted events on selected tracks, and then all the events that were muted on the selected track were taken care of. So we could think of it as doing a series of keyboard shortcuts. So if you find yourself doing the same function, that's seven keystrokes, that's nine keystrokes, you could create that into a macro and have Cubase execute all those functions for you. So that's really kind of the intention of the macro. Okay, so we have a question from Taylor. Uh, in the MIDI editor in Cubase 11, the volume control of a single note in the status line isn't working. Is there a preset to make this work or is this a bug? So when we look at a MIDI editor, so let's say if we come here, uh, 
So if I wanted to look at a single MIDI note, we could just come over here, we could select the MIDI note and here, you know, the volume uh, MIDI message, which is uh, CC7. So if I wanted to come over here to CC7, what we're going to do is, is, so if I come to the main volume, this is gonna be for all of the notes that are on that particular channel. Uh, so it's not MIDI volume isn't associated with a particular MIDI note message. So the velocity, which often indicates how loud or soft a particular note is, that is part of the MIDI note message. Now with the VST 3.5 instrument, if you have the uh, note expression mode activated here, we could double click and at this point, choose to draw in when we have our note expression selected, we could choose volume and be able to kind of draw in volume on a note by note basis. But generally the MIDI specification is you have main volume that's gonna work on every note, not on an individual note uh, within the MIDI editor. So, but you know, with the VST 3.5 instruments, um, so if you're using like Howlian, Sonic, Howlian, you know, Retrolog, Pad Shop, all of that can be used as part of the note expression. So that may be why you don't see it in the MIDI editor. Okay, so we see uh, from Robbie Bowling, for those with the knowledge, are Thunderbolt devices compatible with USB 4 ports now? So I believe that there's some, you know, USB 4 is supposed to be backward compatible with Thunderbolt and USB 3 and USB 2 devices. Now the physical connector is gonna be like a USB, what's called a USB-C. So the connector can be independent of the data format. So I believe that the intention of USB 4 was to be compatible with Thunderbolt 3, which is compatible with Thunderbolt 2, even though you may need a physical adapter cable. Um, so I believe that, you know, it's still early. Like I haven't really seen many USB 4 ports. I imagine that there are some that are starting to occur and be released as we speak. But the intention was instead of having kind of a myriad or just a lot of different uh, protocols that everything could kind of be consolidated under USB 4. So that's kind of the concept of USB 4 that it would uh, give you all Thunderbolt 3 functionality in addition to other USB uh, functions. Okay. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, how can I show the chord track when in Vary Audio? So the chord track doesn't necessarily show, uh, like, you know, one of the things that was added with uh, version 11 was the ability to have global tracks in the MIDI editors. So where we could see those particular functions, but that doesn't carry over into the sample editor yet. So as you're kind of working with this, you may, there isn't a way to currently that I know of, like within the very audio editor here, um, to see the chord track uh, within the sample editor. Um, so even if we wanted to go to, let's say our very audio here, um, so there isn't real way to indicate that. So you might be able to, you know, see the chord track here uh, visually within the editor and have the editor open and see the chord track above. But there isn't a way to currently uh, view the chord track information within the very audio editor. And I've, I've kind of passed that on already, but I'll make sure to reiterate that to the planning team. 
Okay, question. What is the preferred way to automate volume of orchestral tracks? Uh, VST built-in CC or volume in the mixer? It could really depend on the instrument itself. So some instruments don't really, you know, are more responsive to different, how the library is created can be more responsive to like an expression or a modulation controller for the dynamics as opposed to um, having, you know, having the automation in the mixer because as you would adjust the dynamics that could change the number of, you know, players. So you may start with a very small dynamic, maybe four violins. And as you increase, it may bring in eight, 12, 16, 20 violins, depending on how the actual library was created. So while you can definitely mix using inside of the console, I still see most composers that are utilizing the CCs, the MIDI continuous controllers, often expression or modulation, that the that their instrument was designed to respond to for its internal dynamics and how that switches between the different sample layers. So that may be kind of the more realistic sounding option depending on the library. So it could really depend on the library and how the library is responding. But I think most most composers I see are, you know, very heavily invested in MIDI CC data and they've been doing it for years and, you know, they, that's how they kind of think of approaching it. And, you know, they'll have, you know, just their expression pedal or using their mod wheel on their keyboard and be able to use, um, and be able to use that very effectively. All right, so we have uh, Peter checking in from Montreal, and we have Wasted Gamers from Netherlands. Okay, so I see a question. Uh, why does my track uh, change key when I flatten very audio? So if it's changing key by like a semitone or roughly a semitone that would lead me to think that maybe the audio file is in one sample rate and the project is in another sample rate so i would just to make sure that the audio files in your project are the same sample rate and you could set the sample rate here in cubase just by hitting shift s which would open up the project setup and this is also available here when you go to the project menu if you go all the way to the bottom to the project setup at that point you could set the sample rate i would make sure that the file that you're as you write the new file that it's not changing sample rates so that's what it kind of sounds like that's kind of what i would first suspect is a sample rate mismatch All right, so we have Soren in Sweden. Great to see you on the live stream. Okay, so we have a question. Is there options in Howley and Sonic 6, uh, like Microtune in MIDI insert? Um, so when we look at, I assume it's, there's Halion Sonic, uh, three, a Halion Sonic SE three and a Halion six. Uh, but let's go ahead and just take a, we'll open up a new instrument track here and we'll do just a Halion six. Cause I think that's probably what you're referring to. It says I okay. So say I uh, just have this. Um, so for micro tuning, you know, so if you wanted to, you could if you wanted to do your tuning like to four forty two or four thirty two, you could adjust your tuning scale here. 
if we if you are doing you know the instrument itself is a VST 3.5 instrument and that does give you capabilities for when you're doing uh, even her mode tuning which we'll show uh, a little bit later we had a question come in right before the live stream or if you wanted to be able to so let's say if I have uh, I'll just find maybe like more of a synthy patch here so let me just um look for one i was just thinking of all right i'll just try one of the all right let me just Try quick voltage here. Okay, so let's say we want to take just something kind of like that. You know, but this instrument can respond to, you know, independent pitch bend on different instruments. So when I wanted to come here to my MIDI insert, uh, we could just do this will respond to kind of like a micro tuner plugin. So let's say if I wanted to uh, make my C flat. Uh, so let's say I want the E to be sharp and the G to be in tune. So you don't have to do anything special for any of the VST 3.5 instruments. I could just come here and have the C be very sharp. And let's say I want the G. So you could have that automatically kind of follow the different tuning that you have in uh, the plugin. So you don't really have to do anything special, but that supports already built into like Howling and Sonic SE, Howling and Sonic 3, or Howling and 6. So let me know if that's what you wanted to accomplish. Okay, we have a question. Uh, I keep having issue with pulling down volume in the automation lane and temporarily freezing only of that part. The rest of Cubase works, but the volume gets frozen. Okay, so let's say if I just go to um, this part. So I'm not sure if I understand, but we'll take a stab at it here. So let's say, um, so let's say if we pull down the, we have volume in our automation lane uh, and temporarily and temporary freezing of that part, the rest of it works, but the volume gets frozen. So let's say if I just wanted to draw in some notes here. So it seems like I don't have it. So it seems like everything is kind of working as expected. You could make sure that you have you know, if this isn't turned on, make sure that you have the read enabled. So once the automation is open, make sure that you have the read enabled. Otherwise you could, you know, not have much response uh, if the read is disabled. So see if it's that. And, but if I misunderstood the question, let me know. So I see uh, Agent K is just saying, oh no, YouTube is deleting my links. So I'm just gonna check to make sure. Um, okay, so I, Agent K, I just, just let you know, I still have you set as moderator status, but let me know if that's not working for you. Um, but it looks like everything is kind of set as we expect here for you to do moderation, which will allow you to post links.
All right, and occasionally my chat field will jump on me, so I apologize like it just did. So I'll just find my space. Okay. Okay, so we see uh, last week I've updated Cubase Artist 10.5 to Pro 11 for just $150, regularly $250. I'm so excited about it. Yeah, so there is a promotion, I believe, going on through May 2nd, maybe, uh, for if you're upgrading, let's say, from like Cubase Artist to Pro or Elements to Artist, if there's a 40% discount currently. So it's a great promotion to take advantage of if you wanted to jump jump in. Okay, so just see from Jazz Dude, uh, if no one else asks, can you give a little insight on the new Cubase update? So uh, yesterday, there's 11.02 was released, and that's going to add uh, some significant new kind of features under the hood. Uh, one of them is going to be Rosetta 2 support for the M1 Silicon Max. So this way it will be working, uh, you know, very well with all the Rosetta aspects of the M1 Silicon Max on the PC platform. I can't really show it on the Mac, but if you go to general, one of the things is you could, you'll have the ability under the high DPI mode where you could have Cubase have its own independent scaling. Uh, so you'll see that under, so that could override the the, applica the operating system functions right there um, and have Cubase kind of work independently of that. You know, there's longstanding things that, uh, you know, there's, I think, about 60 different enhancements and fixes. You know, people had complained a lot about, uh, you know, like when you do a new project and you wanted to delete something from the hub. So now you could come right over here and just remove from the list. So you could, you know, delete directly from the hub. Uh, like the transport behavior is now when you hit play. And let's say, and my new MIDI part sounds lovely. All right. Uh, but when you kind of hit stop twice, it'll go back to the return position. So as we uh, will just kind of play a little bit ar around with that. Um, and there's a number of other just little things kind of behind the scenes that have been uh, updated as far as maintenance. But, you know, probably the two biggest ones were going to be uh, the high DPI, independent high DPI scaling and the Rosetta m1 support on mac and just lots of other little things that probably many people never ran into so all right so we have graham checking in from royal wooten wooten in bassett in wiltshire in uk thanks for joining us in the live stream all right wonderful to see michael pierce as well All right, so a question. Can you show us a general video track and work with synced audio for a TV commercial, for instance? Okay, so let's jump over here. I think I have... Okay, so if we have a video track inside of Cubase, you could see it directly on your timeline. You could hit the F8 key, and this would allow you to open up a video preview window, and you could double click to have that uh, window automatically go to full screen or double click and have it be in a small window. So if you wanted to take this to a dedicated monitor, you could do that. It's the Steinberg office in case you're curious what it looked like. Um, so <clears throat> as we work with video, so some, some of the things that can make Cubase unique is if you go to the transport mode, there's a thing called uh, use video follows edit mode. So what this is going to allow you to do is as we move an event in the timeline, you could actually see the particular... Um, the video update frame by frame. So even if you wanted to just come over here and move an individual note, and I wanted this note to fall 
right at a specific point in the video. And I can just, I'll just turn off my snap here. So as I just move this, like I say, I want this to go right where we have the synthesizer there. And that's where exactly where I want that note to start. We could just have that synchronize. And as we're working, we could also say, you know, I want the video to start right here at that point. And that's where I, I need measure 25 in my song. So I could go to time warp and I could move measure 25 right to that position. And let's say I need, you know, eight measures to fit into right here where we see Florian. Uh, and then I could just say measure 33 ends right here. So I could say between this point and that point, I need eight measures of music. And what that'll do is insert the tempo changes so that you can have an even number of measures for that specified amount of of time in the video so that you can score and not have, you know, seven, eight, 15, 16 measures, uh, different stuff like that. So those are a couple tips on kind of getting started with video for working uh, with commercial. Okay, so we have a question. What is the best use of hit points and audio warping from hit points? So if you wanted to do some more like, you know, audio warping stuff. I think this comes in, could be like really handy for, you know, doing stuff like, you know, just like little rhythmic corrections. So let's say if I wanted to go to maybe a guitar part here. So let's go to my hit points and I'm going to have Cubase automatically just kind of come over here and we could adjust our threshold at what point we want the hit points. So if I wanted to, you know, like every little chord change, we, we could adjust that. Now, if we're on our hit points tab here, one of the great things is one, you could create a groove quantized preset. So if you wanted uh, a MIDI part to be locked directly to this guitar, but if you wanted to do kind of working with warp markers, what you could do now is just click on create warp markers. Now, when we go to our audio warp, we go to our free warp section. So let's say I'll just come over here to the hit points again. So I won't have anything selected. So we'll just say, you know, create warp markers based on the hit points, go to your audio warp. And now we could just choose to, you know, do all of, okay, I just want this note here. I want that note to be, you know, kind of moved over. So, and we could do this kind of multiply as well. So let's say I'll just start this from scratch and I'll revert the project. So we'll just look right at, we'll go to our hit points. All right, and we'll say create warp markers. And now that we're in free warp, we can say this note was a little early or a little late. Um, and at this point, we could just say, uh, that needs to be, that was, you know, they rushed the beat, they're behind the beat. You could just kind of stretch and change the rhythmic feel of your different parts very quickly. So that's where I would use kind of hit points in conjunction with uh, warping, you know, to do free warping without having to manually set all of these. All right. Okay, so we have uh, Michael Marshall, and he had sent an email earlier, but since he brought it up in a discussion, it says, uh, I sent an email about VST Connect, always comes in as a stereo track with left side blank. Okay, so what you could do is, let's say I have a new project. I will come over here. Let's uh, add a VST connect. So I'll just say, 
We're going to create a VST connect, and this will often just kind of simplify kind of the whole process. Um, okay, so now we're here, and we want to do a recording of this. So we see that this, when you do this process of going to the VST Connect SE or the VST Connect Pro, let's see, I think my computer is. My mouse is frozen. I'll just okay. I think my mouse ran out of battery. Sorry about that. Um, so when we come over here, we'll see that it'll automatically create an audio track. But what you can do is just add uh, an audio track. We'll just my mouse is acting weird. Let me see if I can get my, to charge my mouse while we're doing this. Bear with me just a second, sorry about this. Okay, so I'll charge my mouse here. Okay, so when we go to add an audio track, so I'll just add a mono track. And then what you can see is when you're here, you can see that you have VST Connect. Uh, and also will create a stereo track. So now what I want to do in this track is just set a VST Connect. And you could set it to, it sounds like you have it in, uh, the left side is blank. So probably just set it to, the VST connect right and then hit record. And I think that will uh, just be able to record in mono. So you're not recording a mono source in stereo with one of the sides blank. So once again, just come here and make sure that you add an audio track, choose a mono track. And for its input, just choose the VST connect left or right, depending on which uh, input that the performer is actually uh, connected to. Okay. All right, so we see Jay from Connecticut just popping in to say hello. Great to see Jay. All right, wonderful to see Gareth on the live stream. Okay, so we just see a question. Uh, hi, one of my sessions is failing to load. It worked the past week since creating it, but there's no error code. It just states not responding in my task manager. How can I fix this? So you probably will have, if you look in the settings, you know, by default, Cubase will do kind of like an auto save. Uh, so let's say if I want it to come over here. So you'll probably see these like .bak files. So I would try to open up uh, maybe the previous backup file, the .bak file, uh, and see if that will open. If that doesn't do the trick, what I would do is maybe start Cubase and you could start it in safe mode and probably bypass third-party plugins. And you could do that by starting Cubase and immediately after launching the program, hold down Alt Control Shift or Command Option Shift and hold that down and that will take you into a safe start mode. And that could, you could choose to delete or temp to delete uh, or 
what I would select is to temporarily bypass the program preferences and third-party plugins and see if you could open up the project that then. And if so, I would just save it under maybe a different name and then see if you could open it up with the current program preferences and the third-party plugins afterwards. That's what I would try to do. Okay, so we see a question from Tim Weinheimer. I added some bars before zero to have a count in, and then I delete it. Uh, delete it to two bars now. It now says 13 is my first bar, not, not zero. How do I get the grid back to zero instead of 13 using the project setup? Okay, so let's say I go to the project setup, and I have, uh, like I wanted to take this and have a two bar count in. Um, so we see that, but if we go to our project setup, so we see that I now have a two bar display bar offset. So I have minus one, zero, and then beat one. So you could try to set this to zero. And then if I do that, oh, it should start as measure one. So we could just see that directly right there. So just make sure, try Tim going into your project setup and it's the project menu to project setup or shift S and try set the display bar offset to zero. Um, so it says, I, so I'm not sure why it's saying 13. Um, so it says delete it to two bars, but now it says 13. So I'm not sure why it would jump to that, but I'm also, Tim, if you could indicate how you deleted the two bars, if you just deleted it in time, or if you deleted it by adjusting the value in the, uh, in the uh, display bar offset. All right, so we see Eduardo Bartolotto loves Cubase. That's great. Thanks for joining us on the live stream. Okay, so we have a question from Jay from Connecticut. Uh, I was trying to collaborate with someone on multiple takes of a verse, but I can't seem to figure out a way to import tracks into comping. Uh, could we add a feature? So if we have an audio file here, so let's say if I have different audio, like maybe a vocal takes here. Um, so I'm going to open up the lanes. So let me just close my automation. So I have a lane here and I'm going to drag that file into a lane. I could take, uh, let's say lane two, and I wanted to take lane one, you know, so there, so anytime that you have uh, multiple lanes, you could just drag and drop the audio directly into the lanes as you see fit. And it'll always give you kind of an extra lane as a buffer. But so I would try to do that. So, you know, there's not a way to uh, manually say take these six audio files and turn it into lanes currently, but I'll, we had that feature request and I'll make sure to reiterate it again, uh, just to kind of save some time, but you can just manually drag it in, just open up the lanes and, uh, you could, you know, just physically just drag the different audio files into independent lanes. All right, so we see Michael Teams from Weatherford, Texas has made it. Thanks for joining us, Michael. We all look forward to the ice cream, all right. All right, we see Michael Pierce is happy that Pablo has two macros and my computer named after him, so. All right, so we see Michael Teams giving some kudos to Jan for the Cubase Index site. 
and gets their first ice cream of the live stream. All right. Okay, so we have uh, hi Greg uh, Guido from Bologna. Bologna. Uh, I often use instrument loaded in rack mode with MIDI track assigned to it. The problem is, how can I then make automation on a VST parameters inside the MIDI track? So it's not going to necessarily go inside the MIDI track. So let's say if I come here to my VST eyes and I'll add an instrument rack. So let's say I just do retro log. Okay, so and so we have uh, our MIDI track that's being routed to Retrolog. So let's say if I play along here, and I just put Retrolog into, you know, into automation. So now it's just going to be recorded as automation directly into the Retrolog folder. So this is where the automation for the VST resides. So and that's kind of how it works is the MIDI track itself doesn't have automation because it's just MIDI. And that could be the same as going out to an external instrument. So that's why it's kind of decoupled. And if you wanted those two together, you know, you may want to, you know, the that's kind of what the intention of the instrument track is. So now when I add a retro log uh, as an instrument track, I could come over here and as I hit record, so say I automate the parameters, I could just come here. Then it's all within the uh, particular instrument track. So it's gonna be kind of decoupled with the MIDI track being sent to a virtual instrument. Um, but the automation is still there. You could just see it in under the VST instruments name. So if you really want it to be, you know, directly in that particular track with its MIDI data, can, you know, maybe consider using an instrument track instead, but it's still going to be there. Okay, so we see a question, how to use Guitar Rig in Cubase. So it's gonna just show up once you have it installed. Uh, so Guitar Rig will just show up as an insert. So I don't have Guitar Rig installed on my system, but I have, if I go to my distortion, I could open up like the VST amp rack, and this would give me all sorts of wonderful amp modeling technology here with different amplifiers. Um, so this way, depending on how you have it inserted, you can see the audio will go through here. If the if your audio interface is set up for direct monitoring, uh, so if you choose your audio interface and have direct monitoring enabled, you may not hear the guitar being sent through the plugin because the input of the audio interface input is going directly to the output bypassing all of the software plugins and reverbs and inserts and EQs. So make sure if you have it loaded up and it's not working, make sure that you have direct monitoring disabled. And then that should allow you to run any of the different guitar amps, uh, as plugins and if you're not seeing it as a plugin you could go i think it's still limited to being vst2 if you go to your vst plugin manager you could see under uh your vst effects you should be able to see the guitar rig there and if you don't see any of your plugins you could just make sure because it's a vst2 that you have the vst2 plugin path on the folder defined here and then Cubase should be able to, to find the guitar rig. Okay. All right, so a space crawler joined us for the live stream, thanks.
I see Tim Weinheimer's calling Michael Teams the ice cream administrator. So that's good. All right, so we have Dallas LaRue from Las Vegas on the live stream. Thanks for joining us. Okay, so we have a question from Jay. Uh, what is the difference between VST3 and VST3.5, especially for Cubase Nuendo effects and virtual instruments? So it's mostly with the virtual instruments and VST 3.5 added the ability of having the note expression uh, where we could have the independent MIDI controllers like volume or panning or filters instead of that being limited as is, as is in the MIDI like you know 1.0 spec for years and years or decades. Uh, where it's going to be for the channel with VST 3.5, we could have like the independent pitch shifting and independent controllers on independent notes. So that way, if I'm looking at a particular MIDI message, uh, I could have different controllers. Let's say if I have two notes, I could just double click on a note when this mode is active, this E, and then I could draw in uh, different controllers on this note as opposed to this note, even though they're on the same MIDI channel, which is kind of a something we that was a limitation in the original MIDI specification. So that's what VST 3.5 is added. I think we're up to VST 3.7, which will incorporate all the MIDI 2.0 functionality. I don't think it has much of a difference for uh, audio effects, primarily for virtual instruments. Okay, so we see, is there a way to show mod wheel automation in the sequencer, like volume and such, and not in the editor? Can't seem to figure it out. Okay, so let's say if I take this particular part here and I have these notes playing. Okay, so I'll just do my 21st century composition here. Okay, so let's just say I'll Okay, so if I wanted to record modulation data, I could just come right over here. So let's say I just wanted to uh, record the data directly into the editor itself. So I'll come And I'll just kind of put this in record. Okay, so we could see that we have modulation data that I just recorded. So if I wanted to see this, let's come over to uh, our MIDI track. And if I wanted to just come here, we could just say modulation. And at that point, uh, if I did this, maybe on an instrument track. So let me just do this on instrument track here and I'll undo. Okay, so I'll record now um, into my Retrolog MIDI track. So So I'm able to record in the editor and okay. So I have my modulation data here. So now, um, so now, so we can see it in the editor. But if we go to, let's say our CC automation setup. So here we could say I want my modulation to show as an automation track. 
All right, so now um, I wanted to come over, let's say to here, we'll switch this to volume. And now you could just see kind of as you record the data in. So if we go to your MIDI, to your CC automation setup, you can now record the, the data in as modulation. So, or I could just choose this um, as well. So now I'll record the retro log data. I'll record the, the modulation. So I'll go ahead and delete the modulation I have here. And now the modulation is just showing up directly um, in you know, you could just see it directly in uh, the the MIDI CC data here. So you just go directly to the MIDI to CC automation setup, and then you could just say, I want modulation to uh, record directly into not the MIDI part, but into automation tracks. And then anything that you do, the modulation will just be uh, shown as automation data. Okay. Okay, so say I want to back up or copy my projects to, this is a question from Robbie. I want to back up or copy my projects to an external drive. Can I just copy the whole folder? Uh, or what's the best way? So if you if you've been careful in all the files that are in the you know all the files in the project are in that folder, and you have the settings so that as you import files, they get placed into the project folder, which could be done. Um, so when you go to preferences, so say we go to editing audio, and you can say on import audio files, you could say. If you have copy all files to project folder, and if you have that set, you know that you're pretty careful with like the files for a project, you could then just back up the folder. If you have any uncertainty, like, oh, I used a bunch of loops, I'm not sure if that's in there. At that point, I would just do a backup project and select the hard drive, and that would then copy all the files from the folder directly into the new folder, like on your backup drive. And then that will kind of allow you to minimize files. So if you recorded, you know, 400 measures of guitar solo, but you use three measures of it, you know, you could say, get rid of the 397 measures that I'm not using. So you could do stuff like that. But if you're careful and, you know, all the files are in the project folder, you could just simply move the project folder over to your backup drive and you'll be all set. Okay, reading through comments. Thanks for all the wonderful discussion. If you've learned something new, make sure you hit the like button. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, make sure you do that as well. All right, so we have Philippe uh, Oliv Oliveria. Sorry if I butchered your pronunciation or your name, but welcome to the live stream. Thanks for joining us. Uh, so you just see question, how can I improve the latency of render or export? Um, so if it's, you know, I think that most of it would be uh, pretty fast. I've seen some people when they want to improve kind of the export speed, and I haven't tested this, but if you go to like your audio interface uh, and go to the control panel. I've seen on some forums where people will raise the buffer size and that could speed up uh, like the export audio mix down process. Um, so that may be a method uh, to improve the speed, but you know, sometimes it's just gonna take a while depending on your CPU and what you're asking it to do. 
Okay, so we have a question. Any way that we can link our Cubase to Dorco? So I think we'll see more and more integration coming on. Uh, but currently, you know, there isn't a synchronization method. You know, some people were thinking that we should have kind of like a rewire type function, but I think we'll see kind of rewire technology is kind of not moving forward as quickly as operating systems are. So that may not be such a viable option in the future, but what you can do is, you know, you could choose to export it as MIDI files or as music XML files. So once you're in the score editor, you could export it as a music XML file and import that directly into Cubase or Dorico uh, from either way. Okay, so we have a question. Is there an easy way to create a harmony from a MIDI track copied from the session? I'm looking to take a violin MIDI track and create a harmony from the duplicated track. Um, so let's go ahead and give that a shot. So we'll just come right over here. I'll do just a fast violin melody and let's try. I'll come. Let's add an instrument track and all right, and let me just. All right, so let's say I just have a quick uh, MIDI melody here. So let's say I'll just. Okay, so let's say I did something in D minor. So let's say I want to duplicate this. All right, so let's say uh, just I'm going to duplicate this track. Then now we'll have two instruments kind of playing the same part. Okay, so what I want to do is on this track, I'm going to just transpose. So I'll go to MIDI and let's choose uh, our transpose setup. And we could actually just do scale correction. So I could say, okay, I wanted this to be in D uh harmonic minor and let's go up um let's say a third here so i'll come hit okay and now let's listen to the two parts together So you could do stuff like that. Um, so again, just come to the transpose setup. And then if you know what the key is, or you say, okay, let's make it D. Uh, our new scale will just choose to be, you know, our D harmonic. Uh, so now I'll just come here and do that again. So... So just go to your transpose setup and then you could automatically just say, okay, I want to keep the current scale. You could do, you know, different scale correction if needed. You could also keep notes within particular ranges. So you could play around with the transpose setup. Great. <clears throat> just reading through comments. Thanks for all the great questions and discussions. If you learned something new, make sure you hit the like button. Let me 
see a nice comment from Space Crawler. Such a cool community here in this channel. So, <clears throat> all right. So we have Juan Contreras, uh, his first time attending the live stream. Welcome. We hope to see you on more. And feel free to ask any question on your Cubase or Steinberg products. Michael Teams wants everyone to whack the like button. So, all right, my chat field just kind of jumped. Let me find my spot. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. Okay, so I think I'm close. All right, so we have a question. Uh, can you explain about the maximizer in Cubase 11? Is it different than Cubase 10? Uh, it now has a brick wall limiter included, or do I still need to put a brick wall limiter after the maximizer? So it doesn't have a brick wall limiter included, um, but what, it's, what it does have is there's a new algorithm. I think this was introduced maybe in 10 or 10.5. Um, so it's one, it's either 10 or 10.5, but it, when we go to, let's say our, uh, our maximizers, there's one that's kind of more, uh, attuned and optimized for, uh, dance music. So, but it, it's not necessarily limited to dance music. I'll, I'll show it on maybe a rock thing here quickly. Um, just... So I'll we'll activate this. So if we wanted to, and we could just put this on our master bus here. So the change in the maximizer, uh, and we'll find this under dynamics, is this modern algorithm. So let's say if we're just kind of playing along here, So I'll turn on the plugin now. And let's say if I put on modern, so this is just a different algorithm. And it's gonna add the recover and release times. So you hear kind of different tonality to it. So just kind of taking So just slightly different flavors. So it doesn't, you know, replace or negate a brick wall limiter. You could use both of them in conjunction with each other. Uh, but that was kind of the recent change within the last couple of years of the Maximizer plugin. It was that modern algorithm. All right, so we have a question. Hi, Greg, what is the best way to treat real drums in order to minimize bleeding? Um, well, if you had the mic set up, ideally that will help, but there's always gonna be bleeding on drums. Uh, so some things that you could do is, let's say if I just wanted to go to, uh, let's solo some of our drum parts here, just so we could hear a little isolated.
All right, so I'm just gonna go to insert. You know, so sometimes you could fight bleed or make the bleed kind of work for you. But let's say if we wanted to go to our dynamics and let's go to a gate. You know, it's so often just a simple gate can make a huge difference. And here you can kind of set, you know, the range of it as well. So without, you hear the hi-hats, you'll hear snares, toms, and just putting the gate on. So that's the first thing I would do, you know, so as you just want to do that, you know, just kind of do gates and sometimes people will put an EQ before the gate. So it's only going to EQ particular frequency. So you could say, I just want the kick frequencies to go through and negate the hi-hat frequencies. But, you know, first thing I would do is just, you know, go for a gate to clean up, you know, a lot of drum bleeding, you know, and realize that, you know, sometimes you may want to have the bleed work for you, you know, and that's what makes real drums kind of often sound like real drums as well. So. All right, so it says uh, we have uh, hi from Mauritius Island. Um, I probably said that wrong. Uh, can you help me how to record in 528 hertz? Uh, where to find this option in Cubase 10.5 Pro? Um, so I'm not sure if the frequency you're saying is, uh, if that is, you know, it's, I don't think it's like, I'm not sure if it's a DSD type of high sampling rate, you know, Cubase can record up to 192K sample rate, or if it is maybe a tuning thing, but you know, any frequency that you send into Cubase, you know, de you know definitely including 520 hertz, 528 hertz uh, will be captured. So maybe if you could specify what you, if it's a sampling rate or if it's a tuning scale because even if you have alternate tunings you know some people want to record everything in 432 or 442 or a is tuned to 440 um so there's you know different tuning scales i'm not sure if it's a tuning scale or like a sampling rate uh that you want to capture but anything you know any sample rate that you any frequency that you have you know whatever your converter can capture you know generally 20 to 20k uh, could definitely be, you know, recorded into Cubase without any issues. Okay. Okay, so we just see, um, uh, I upgraded my PC to Core i9 with 64 gigabytes of RAM, and I have PreSonus Isolation 24C audio interface. Uh, but I'm facing Cubase crackles uh, while playing. Need advice, please. So I would really kind of look, you know, you could get something, um, there are different utilities. So if you haven't adjusted the buffer size, you know, you could come over to your studio setup. If you're getting a lot of crackles, uh, it could be that you just have to raise the buffer size. And as you kind of start working, you know, often with faster computers, you could run lower buffers. But realize that when you run lower buffers, it makes your computer work harder. And if you run a lower buffer size, it's sending more data out quicker. And it makes your CPU work harder. And if some component, like maybe a Wi-Fi connection on your computer or a display driver kind of takes a little too much time for that stream to go down a very small data that could cause interrupts. And so there are different utilities on Windows, maybe uh, I think uh, DPC latency monitor or latency mon, uh, I think is a name if you do a search for that. And that could help you isolate different components in your operating system that could be causing those interrupts that could be 
causing your audio interface to crackle. So I would try, you know, increasing the buffer size <clears throat> and then maybe doing a little bit of investigation with DPC latency mod. And you could, you know, turn off part of your, you know, part, uh, you know, it's like, do I need my Wi-Fi? Let's turn that off and see if that makes a difference. If I turn my network card off, will that make a difference? So often being able to isolate it, that's a great utility for that. Okay, great to see Mandy Lane back on the live stream. Welcome back. Great to see you. All right, so we see um, Philippe uh, says, I think I'll finally go for Cubase 11 Pro with that 40% off. So, yeah, it's a wonderful opportunity to do. All right, so we see John is saying Cubase is awesome. All right. Uh, so we see from Alex Morgan, hi Greg, is there a way to create new MIDI instrument tracks from MIDI notes in a pre-existing track? Example, piano map in four notes can create four MIDI tracks for strings with each part copied to a new MIDI part, to new MIDI track. Um, so there are some ways to do this. Let's just uh, do a new project here. Thank you for all the wonderful questions. If you've learned something new, make sure you hit the like button. All right, so let's say I'll just do a quick chord track here. Okay, so let's say now I'll just add Okay, so I'm just going to take this part here all right, so let's say we have some chords. Okay, so if you wanted to do some stuff like that, you know, let's, let's say, I'll just come here, let's look at our part. Um, so, you know, what some people will do is just kind of manually copy notes. So if you wanted to copy and paste, uh, but you could also do some of this stuff with, uh, I'll, I'll try one thing here. You know, on individual chords, you could probably, um, it probably wouldn't make sense. It's probably more for drums is what I was thinking. But let's go to like our MIDI editor here. So let's say let's go to our logical editor. And I will we're gonna choose to extract or let's try to insert exclusive. And then we're gonna say type is equal to note. Uh, and our context variable could be, um, or let's, all right, so I'll just say position in chord track. So let's say, I would say, let's just do this to zero. So if I did this right, we can see that we have, um, these notes here and what I want to do is okay so I just got rid of everything else let me just undo that so let's try extract okay so what this has done is it's automatically taken the lowest note from 
So our base has automatically been dropped down and automatically placed into its own track. And then if I wanted to do that again and do that again, so now we have all four of these parts into, um, so now each, each voice has been split so that each one of those voices is on a different part. So if I wanted to just double click there, we can see an octave higher based on the chords. So at this point, all of them have been split. So we just chose under function to extract, type is equal to notes, context variables equal to note in chord, and zero is the lowest note in a chord. So you could try that, Alex. Uh, I think that will help you get to where you need to be. Okay, so I just see a question, Greg, why do you use Cubase 10.5 Pro here? So I think some of my projects may have been created in Cubase 10.5 Pro, but uh, I'm running Cubase 11.02. So, but some of my projects may say that because I haven't saved them in, you know, some of my projects were created in previous versions and I try not, I try to have a known starting point so I don't save my project. So that's why you may see, you know, a version indicated on uh, some of the projects, but I'm running 11.02, latest versions that's always available to customers. All right, so John Wells wants everyone to hit the like button. There's so much useful stuff here. All right, so we have Lawrence from Rhode Island. Wonderful to see you on uh, the live stream. All right. All right, you see Tim Weinheimer's liking the new update. Okay, we have a question. Uh, I want to test some chain of effects with audio loops in the result list of Media Bay without affecting the main audio stereo out. Um, is there some audio routing um, I should configure? Okay, so let's go take a look. So let's say if I'm here, I could, let's say, okay, we'll go to my uh, loops here. So I let's say I wanted to go and test this through uh, different, uh, different outputs. So what you could do, so say I'm here and I wanted to go to my control room and I say, I wanted to listen to QMix 1. And let's say if I click on inserts for QMix 1, let's put some really obvious things here. So let's say now I wanted this to go through uh, a flanger. So every time that I will audition, let's see if it gets routed through the flanger here. So now I'll just put this on auto. Just see if I'm routing through there. It doesn't look like that's sounding. I'll just try uh, maybe just a really nasty distortion. And let's see if we can audition through. Right, so it doesn't look like that's working, but let's try. Uh, if you go through the control room, just the main control room outputs here. So I'll turn that off and let's go to 
click on main here. Okay, so let's go back to your modulation effects. And see if we now audition through Yeah, so now So if you wanted to just put them in the main uh you know, if you click on the main part of you know, click on the main and then have the inserts selected here, you could audition through a chain of effects without it being affected during and the main output of the mix. So just put on the main inserts here on the control room and then you should be able to audition through that. All right, so we just see uh, from Juan, it says on Facebook, it say that uh, this one would address how to set a steady tempo on a live recording with variable tempos. Was this addressed? I'm now watching from the beginning. So we'll go ahead and do this now. So it was one of the questions that was mailed in to us. So let me just go ahead and show it on a multi-track recording. Okay, so let's say if we don't know what the tempo of our recording is and the recording is actually um, to the point where it's, it doesn't have a bar and beat correlation, it was just kind of recorded freely as if we're recording on analog tape without a click track. So let's say we listen to this. So we have our multi-track. And I wanted this to actually be more in time so if i put my click track on now there's no correlation between the click and what's going on musically so what i could do is i'm going to just select like two tracks i'm going to select like the drum overheads and what I want to do is just a quick tempo detection of that. All right, and I'm gonna do a quick offbeat correction. So now Cubase has figured out what the tempo is of that particular file. And as it's done this, it places it into one four time. So I'm gonna move my time signature up and let's move our tempo track up as well. So we can see basically that at every measure, there is a slightly different, every beat, there's basically a slightly different tempo. So I'm gonna find kind of the downbeat of this project. So it's right here where the kick is. And Cubase figured out what the beats are, but what we need to do is to tell it where the downbeat is. So I'm gonna click right here. And as we listen to this, if I did it right. So we figured out what our tempo is of this particular file. So it's fluctuating from like 144, 144, 145. But if I wanted this to all be perfectly steady or to increase, what I could do is I need to assign these tempo changes of every single beat into all of the audio files. So what I'm gonna do now is just to select all the files. I go to the audio menu to advanced and I say set definition from tempo. So we could save this information in a project or actually embed the metadata into the audio files themselves. So I'll hit okay. 
And it'll take just a second. We'll see his little icon appear in the upper right-hand corner once that's done. So now that we do this, I will just come over here and I'm going to just play this so that as we just listen to it now, it's going to follow whatever tempo track that we do have. So I'll say, okay, here's our tempo track. So now I'm gonna say play a perfect 155 beats a minute. Or play 120 beats a minute. So now as we listen to it. And let's say I want it to go back to my original tempo but I want it to be 144 beats a minute. Now everything is perfectly in time. And every single beat of every single track is stretching to accommodate the new tempo change. Now, if I wanted it to speed up, I could just come here, I'll activate the tempo. So it's gonna follow the original tempo track and then I'll make this a little larger. I could select different portions of the tempo. So let's say I want to do an accelerando there. So as the track goes on. It'll just speed up. And we see it just kind of get faster and faster. And when it gets to this point in the song, it's just going to go back to the original tempo. So tempo is still increasing. We're about 155 now. And now it's gonna go to the original tempo. I could also just take this and say, I want this tempo to be, instead of it fluctuating so much, I could actually just regulate it so that it's tighter when I could raise the whole thing but make it tighter so it's not fluctuating as much. So that's some of the great stuff that you could do with tempo manipulation. So, all right, so just seeing um, uh, further comment uh, about the tuning question that we had. So it says in Halion Sonic, I could go 432 to 440, I think, but not 528 hertz. So I just wanted to try. Um, so, you know, if you wanted to go up to 528 hertz, you know, I, I don't know anyone that tunes A to 528, uh, but you could just put a pitch bend value on it. So. All right, so just see, I think this might be a comment or question. Uh, Cubase 11 can load older projects. So you could load projects back to Cubase SX uh, 1. So, you know, 11 versions earlier, the same file formats will load. Uh, some of the plugins may not work from, you know, 20 years ago, but, you know, the projects will definitely load, load directly up. Okay. Okay, uh, so we have a question. Is there a way to select all the silence or spaces between words on an audio take and then lower those spaces at once uh, or move all those spaces to a new audio track? All right, so let's say if I wanted to take, you know, um, let's say I, I could even take like this little Tom track here where we don't have a lot of activity, but we may have some like tracks that are bleeding through. So let's say as we solo, we'll hear an occasional Tom hit here. All right. So let me just solo this track here. So we'll see, we'll just have like an occasional one Tom hit every once in a while. 
and then the rest of the time it's just kind of bleeding through. So one of the methods that you could use to work with this is just to come and let's go to your audio menu and let's go, I think it's under advanced and you'll see detect silence and you could set your threshold here. Uh, and you could at this point compute and you could say, okay, I just want it to, uh, and at this point we could say just delete the silence so we could just say process and then you could get rid of all the unnecessary and if you want to get rid of track bleeding that's another way of doing that so again just select the file and go to audio to advanced and choose detect silence All right, uh, is in Cubase a trim VST like in Pro Tools? I'm not familiar with, uh, I don't think we need it as part of a plugin. Uh, I'm not familiar with the plugin in Pro Tools, but what you can do is anytime that you're in the channel strip, you have a pre-gain setting. So let's say if I just wanted to come to like the base part here, I could just say, okay, let's go to our base part and you see this pre-gain. And you could have an additional 48.2 dB of cut or boost. And that's before it kind of hits the signal. So you could just come right there and adjust. And you can see this as part of the pre section. And you could, you could access it inside the EQ section. So let me know if that's kind of the equivalent. So it's not a separate plugin, but just part of the channel EQ. Okay. Okay, so we just see how come track presets don't save groups and folders or colors. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look. So I think you could save that not as a track preset, but probably as a track archive. So let's go ahead and give that a shot. So let's say if I have um, this folder where I have a number of drums. So I'm going to just select the folder track and the drums and I'm going to go to export uh, and we'll export selected tracks. So I'll say we're gonna, we'll just reference the files or we could copy the actual files. Okay, and we'll call this um, sub, 403. Okay, and I'll do a new project. And let's import a track archive. So I'll do this and so the, the colors aren't carried over, but everything, and let me just route these to a group track and we'll just make sure that we'll, I'll just send these to a group track as well. And we'll include that. So I'll just export this with a group this time. Sorry about that. All 
right? So now I'll import my track archive. And you can see the group is included and you could just come right over there. And then while the colors didn't carry over, but all the settings that you have in a group, all the tracks, they'll all be carried over. So try just exporting. Okay, uh, so I just see I'm running 11 Pro on Windows 10. I automated the cutoff on Retrolog 2, but somehow I automated the volume on a different channel. Uh, any idea why I just clicked on Learn in Retrolog? So if you had another track that was selected, it could be that, you know, so let's say if I come here and let me add two instruments, So say we'll add two retro logs. Okay, so, and I will, just come here and, Okay, so let's say I learn a MIDI CC here and I'm just gonna move my modulation. So let's say learn CC. Okay, so now when I, if I have both of these in record, okay. So if you had two tracks that were recorded, you might have recorded, you know, modulation. And if you use a controller that was doing volume, um, so now I could see that I have modulation here, but, and in this track, let's take a look. Um, so it could be that maybe you had another track active and set to record and if you did a MIDI learn function for your modulation wheel that you know maybe you inadvertently recorded just the straight CC into another track so let us know if you're using like a physical uh, like a controller for the MIDI message itself so and that might explain it Okay, uh, question. When I cut an audio event and try to give it a different file name, it changes all the other parts of that event. How can I name them separately? Okay, so let's say I have an audio event here. So let me just go ahead and cut. Okay, so you could just go to your file name here. Okay, so that will be the file name. Let's come here. Okay, so now when you come to that file, you could, so these will kind of, you know, you could also just kind of change the display name here if that's what you want, if it's still kind of the same audio files. So here, when you do it, you could just select it and type in either the file name or the description. So these are all kind of the same audio files, but you know, I would try just from the info line, just 
adjusting the description. And then whenever you kind of hover over, you'll see the new description labeled here, or you could turn it into a new audio file if you do a bounce selection and have an independent name. Okay, reading through some more questions. Thanks for all the great discussions. All right, so we have a question. I always get a CPU overload in real time exports, even though my CPU activity is around 40 to 50% on my computer. Am I doing something wrong? So probably not. I would try you know, out of curiosity to raise the buffer size and see if that makes a difference. So I don't think you're doing anything wrong. Um, so, but you know, I was just reading online that some people that this has helped them when you go to the control panel and increasing the buffer size, and that may give your computer a little more uh, headroom uh, when doing a real time export. All right, so it's just seeing more discussion of, um, you know, tuning to 528 hertz. So, you know, if you actually wanted to hear what 528 hertz sounded like, you could try this. I'm just going to add a quick audio track. And then if you want it to uh, just come to under tools, you could go to test generator. I'll turn this down volume wise, but if you wanted to see what 528 is, and then you could see what it sounds like in triangle square or sawtooth wave. So I'm not sure if it makes sense to, you know, usually when people say tune to, you know, there's a lot of people are doing a tuning a to 432. Um, but I, I haven't heard anyone trying to tune to 528. You know, you could determine what note 528 is if you wanted to write at 528 hertz. Um, if you go to frequency here, we could uh, just determine the actual pitch that frequency is. So we'll go to my frequency EQ and I'll take this particular note and I want this to be 528. Um, and then you could see that that's gonna be roughly, around, a, so that's an A flat. Um, so as we look at 528 will be a C4. Um, so that's, you know, so I'm not sure if you want to tune your, you know, your A to, you know, up to C4, but that's what that note is. So, um, so if you want to know what frequency that is, you could also use, you know, the test tone generators or just kind of, you know, figure it out via the EQ, but, you know, so you give that a shot. Okay, so we have a question. Where are track presets stored on a Mac? Thank you. Okay, so when you go to make a track preset, and I will come here to this, and I will right click and we'll save a track preset, and we're gonna call it 
sub 403. And we'll hit OK. So this will be kind of stored in, so you could find this in the media bay. So let's come over here to media bay. And I think if we just come over here to user content, and then you'll see track presets, audio, and then you'll see it located here. Now, if you wanna know exactly what folder that's in, you could just right click and choose reveal in finder. So at this point, it's going to be in, so your user account, your admin, to library, to application support, to Steinberg, to track presets, to audio, instrument, MIDI, multi, or sampler. And that's where that will be stored. Okay, so we have a question, just make sure, okay. Uh, I noticed the new Cubase 11 download assistant, it is allowing you to install different components of Cubase. If we just installed the software, will it help for snappier screen changes? Um, so I think that, you know, downloading the other components won't really, you know, it gives you all of the content and all of the sounds that you're licensed for with your Cubase, uh, but I don't think it's gonna affect your snappier screen changes. Uh, but depending on, you know, if you're doing, it, it could have an effect like on a Windows side because there were some high DPI settings. And if you're on an M1 Mac, you may see screen improve, like screen redraw improvements because that's been more optimized. Okay, so we have a question. Um, hi, Greg, how to make a click louder or create a click tracks, thanks. Okay, so let's say if I have this as my project and I wanted to set my left and right locators all around this particular area. So if we go to, and I'll just do this with a project that probably makes sense as we play it. Bear with me just for a second. So let's say now I wanted to hear the click. Kind of louder in the project. So if I activate the click, we could just turn this on, hit the letter C. So you could adjust the click volume level if it's going through the control room. And if you go to transport, you could also go to your metronome setup. And if you go to click sounds, there's also an audio click level that you could adjust. So you could get the click track louder like that. Now, if you wanted to put the click track into a separate audio file, you go to the project menu to signature track and say render audio click between locators. Now I could turn off the click track because the click track is now generated as an audio file. And you could adjust the volume level here. So once again, just between the left and right locators, go to your project to signature track and you could render MIDI, or MIDI click between the locators or just render an audio click between the locators and then it'll just be a standard audio file and you could boost that and do different sample processings for normalize if you need to. All right, so we have Helmut Herner from checking in from Austria. Thanks for joining us.
All right. Uh, we have a question from Stephen Butler. Hi, Greg. Uh, we use uh, control plus drag to constrain an event in the timeline when dragging vertically. Should that fail? Is there a way to restore an event to its original position? Okay, so let's say I come here and I, I wanted to make a... Let's say I'll just erase my click track here quickly. All right, so let's say if I come here and I forgot to hold down the modifier key so that it's constrained in the direction. So I wanted this to be in the exact same time. I'll just get my... All right, so let's say I've copied it, but now I want that file to be in the same location. What you could do is come directly to your uh, edit and then you'll see move to and then you could just choose origin. So I think that works with audio and let me see if I if that works with MIDI as well. I'm inclined to think not, but let me just try a quick MIDI part. Let's give it a try. Yeah, so it's just gonna be for an audio thing. But what you could do is say, okay, I wanna take the start position here. And I say 22210, and then I could just So you could, you know, just kind of enter it in here and you could probably paste. So let's say if I made a if I made a copy to here, I could say this starts at um, so let's say this is forty two one zero, and I wanted this to be at the same start position. You can just double click so forty point two point one zero hit enter so you could. Uh, you know, be able to kind of copy and paste the values. So let's say if I come here, let me just copy, come here, paste. So you could do it that way as well for MIDI parts. All right, so Ken wants to remind everyone to please remember to gently caress the like button. So we're two likes away from 100, so we should try to get that done. Okay, so uh, we have a question. Hi, Greg, is there a way to use the comp tool using audio from different track versions? Um, so no, but what you can do is kind of take the track versions and com and convert it to lanes if you wanted to use the comp tool. So let me just take a quick look. I think we have a file here we could show. Okay, so you know if we want it, so the comp tool, if you're not familiar with it, you will allow you to, if you have a number of recordings on different parts, you could just say, okay, I want this, take that part from, and this is my comp performance, and that's very handy, but if we want it, if we had these in track versions, what you could do is I'll just say you go to the project menu and go to track versions and you say create versions from lanes. So now we could see all of our different track versions. Uh, but if I'm in track versions, I could do the converse of that where I could just say track versions and we could say create lanes from versions and that will allow you to use the comp tool uh, on that. Okay, let me just. OK, 
Okay, reading through some more comments. So thanks for all the great comments. All right, and I see we have 106 likes now. Thank you. Allows us to continue to do these live streams. Okay, so you just see question, uh, my Insonic SD1 works on my XP with Cubase 5, on Windows 10 with Pro 11, uh, mono okay, but does not recognize note offs for polyphony. Um, so I'm not sure, Norton, if, it's, if you're using the same MIDI interface uh, between the two of them. Um, I'm trying to think, let's say, I would check also, you know, one thing to, to look at, and this would probably be pretty rare, but if you go to uh, your MIDI preferences and go to MIDI filter, um, so, you know, make sure, I'm trying to see if you have, you know, make sure that it looks like this, that maybe just SysX is being uh, disabled. But you could also check uh, when you add a MIDI track. Let's say I add a MIDI track here, and this is being routed out to my SD1. Uh, go to the MIDI inserts, and at this point, put it on the MIDI monitor and see if you're kind of getting the note on messages and note off messages that you are expecting from there. But uh, there's nothing in Cubase that would really um, do that. And it could be, I'm not sure if you're, when you say mono, okay, but does not recognize note offs for polyphony. If that is a setting maybe in the SD1 itself, if it's in uh, if it's like a patch, if you see that with all patches or only one particular patch, that would be interesting to know as well. But it sounds like it would be something internal in the SD1 to me that, you know, maybe if it's a voice that's trying to be monophonic versus polyphonic. Um, so, but yeah, so let, let us know if that's a particular patch or if it's doing it with all patches. Okay, so we see uh, how to group and ungroup multiple notes together. So let's take a quick look. All right, so let's say if I have, All right, so let's see if I just come here and I'm gonna hit. Not sure if you wanted to, you know, group those, you know, be able to move those notes accordingly, like this, just by selecting, uh, or how what you want to accomplish. I'm not familiar with FL Studio with the. Uh, how the, you know, to group and ungroup multiple notes. So if I just wanted to come here and select that, I could just select and move the notes and click elsewhere, then they're deselected. So let me know exactly how you want to, what you want to accomplish. That'd be good information to know. So I'm not familiar with the function in any other program. All right, wonderful to see Chase Bathia on the live stream. We hope you're feeling better. I know we communicate over email, so hope you're doing well after all your vaccines. Thanks for joining us. Great to see you back. Uh, so question, can I use Cubase as a sound input and output for online lessons? Um, so yeah, you could do that. You, you know, depending on how you're getting Cubase out to, for other people to listen. I know some people will be doing online lessons where they're just using the VST Connect Pro and the other person is just has the VST Connect 
um, and all they're doing is the VST Connect performer, and they're just using that to transmit the audio from their Cubase over. But you know, if you're going through OBS or you're doing it through YouTube or through Zoom, you may there could be some other tools that could help with that. Great. Reading through comments. Um, uh, question: Can in uh, Very Audio can I harmonize a vocal track by playing MIDI keys into Very Audio? So, if let's go ahead and take a look at what we could do. Okay, so when we're in Very Audio, I could just come over here. And uh, so I'll go to my Very Audio mode here, open this up. Okay, so one of the things that you could do here is just uh, to activate MIDI input. So you can say, okay, I'm on. So you could just trigger the notes kind of like that to pick the pitch. But if you have the chord track, you may not even need to do that because what you could do is, let's say I'll just undo all my horrible edits. I'm going to just Let's go to the chord track here and I'll just say create chord symbols. And I could just take, you know, individual parts in very audio here and I'll just say, um, you know, give me harmonies. So I'll just say generate harmonies. So we'll go under the audio menu that would help. So I'll say generate harmony voices. I'll say I want two harmony voices. And now as we kind of play, And you could have Cubase just automatically generate the correct harmony voices for you. And once you're in, uh, you know, these harmony voices, you could just come here, activate MIDI input and be able to, and be able to just, you know, play those particular, you know, voices as you need to. So let's say we'll just come right over here. Let's, and, you know, once you're on a particular note, you have the MIDI input, you could just, just kind of play it uh, from MIDI just like that, so. All right, we see Michael Pierce has to step out for an hour, probably has a job or something to do, a session. All right. Okay, so we have a question. How can I change the time stretch algorithm in Very Audio, or is there only one option? So the algorithm that's used for the Very Audio detection and stretching is gonna be fixed. So uh, at that point, it's just gonna be just to the standard solo mode, so. All right, so we see a question from Michael Teams. Uh, Greg, Zoom on April 30th. So yes, one week from today, we'll do a shortened live stream and we will do uh the last two hours probably starting at 3 p.m eastern time like like one week minus 15 minutes from now we'll start the zoom session if you want to email me at club cubase at steinberg.de i'd be happy to uh send the zoom invite Uh, and we will post the link in the live stream for next Friday. So, all 
right. And I see just my chat field jumped on me. Bear with me just quickly. Thank you for all the wonderful questions. I hope everyone's learned something new. Uh, so I just see a uh, question. Was that orchestral thing you were using available on LE, the one where it shows the sections? Um, trying to remember. So I'm just trying to remember which orchestral thing it was. Maybe if you could refresh my memory. Sorry, we go through a lot of different questions. Uh, and I'm probably just getting old. So, but it, maybe if you could, Wes, if you could refresh my memory, I could maybe answer if the uh, orchestral thing is in LE or not. Um, so it's the orchestral thing, maybe the sounds I was doing are, are coming from Howian Symphonic Orchestra, probably, so. Okay, so we see Sable and Sable Winters in Sub 403. You want people to hit the um, the like button. Okay, so we have a question from Jan, and since he does such a wonderful job with the Cubase Index, we'll make sure we get it answered for him. Uh, the left zone media bay, what I understand is only for Steinberg Media Pack, or is it possible to add third brand or third brand samples only access from me menu media? Media Bay F5. Um, so when we, you could see any library, any audio files directly in Media Bay. So if I don't open a pool window, that'd be helpful. So let's say if I just go to Media Bay here. Um, so any, you know, we can go anywhere on the computer and be able to access, you know, all of our different. Uh, all of the different files that we have. So we could just turn these on and off where it gets to be. And if you know that you always want this to be like a favorites, you could also just kind of right click and add favorites so that you could jump and navigate quickly to there. Where I think, you know, if when people want the media bay to say, like, when we go to loops and samples, where you see all the icons and kind of beautifully organized here with the pretty logos, that I think needs to be done through Steinberg for all the metadata. But, you know, the media bay, um, you know, can so there you can tag and search any audio file it's not limited to just steinberg you could take any audio file say i want to go to this audio file and i wanted to tag and you know add metadata to any of the files that i want to so anything that you're working with you can just come right over here and just navigate freely for anything that you're looking for. So you can say, okay, I'm just looking for audio files. And there I could add my own tagging. So uh, without any restrictions there. So, uh, so Jan continues, are there any disadvantages of third party versus Steinberg and Cubase Media Bay? Can I tag search uh, samples, parts as Steinberg samples? So yeah, the only disadvantage with third party stuff is it may not show up as these icons to navigate, but everything else, you know, the intention of Media Bay is to be able to use all of your media that you're using in your computer and have access to it and not just Steinberg files. All right, wonderful to see Millard Brown on the live stream. You don't have to apologize for being late. We're not in school, so, but we're just glad he made it and we hope you're doing well.
Okay, so I just see, not sure if you're taking requests, but is it possible to sidechain an instrument track, contact bass pad with another instrument track, contact kick, uh, specifically with fab filter C2 compressor? So I, I, I don't think it would be a problem um, to do that. So it just matters if like the plugin that you're using, I know the contact plugins are, are VST2, so they don't, don't offer sidechain, but in this example, I think that the Fab Filter C2 compressor is VST3, so it shouldn't be a problem. So let me go ahead and just kind of create this scenario for you quickly. Okay, so I'll just add, I don't have any of the native instruments on my computer, but we'll show the principle it will be identical. So it's just add a quick retro log track. Okay, and let's find just maybe a pad sound. Okay, sorry for hitting my mic. Let's just come over here. Okay, so let's say I wanted just a pad like that, and I will just. Okay, and I'm gonna add another instrument track, and let's say I just wanna throw in some Groove Agent. Okay, so I will just quickly switch this over to drum editor. Okay. And I'm going to set this to whole notes. Okay, so what I want to do is to, on my sidechain track, let's just set a compressor. And this could be like your fab filter or, or any VST3 compressor. So let's say I'll do the compressor. I want to activate the side chaining and we want our side chain input to come from Groove Agent. And I'll just do a pretty heavy side chain here. So now we'll, we should hear without this plugin, we'll just hear kind of a kick and a pad. And now with this plugin kind of turned on. So you hear that the sound from the groove agent is now setting the side chain. And once the groove agent stops, that track gets uncompressed. So let's say if I wanted to erase maybe some like every other note occasionally, we could hear the compressor. So you can hear the release change. And, there's... and the principle would work for other instruments as well. Just make sure that you go to the side chain input and activate that. 
uh, on your fab filter and you should be good to go. Okay, so I just see MIDI editor. Is it possible to write quintuplets? All right, so let's take a look. Okay, so we want to do a quintuplet, which is gonna be, let me just switch this to bars and beats, where we have five notes uh, entered in. So let's go to our uh, quantize panel. And here I just want to say, let's go to our tuplet and set this to five. Okay, so, and let's set our grid to quarter notes. Okay, so now as I want the grid, I'm going to just All right, so let me just. All right, let me just. So now I'm going to just put it on step entry mode. And I'll come right here and now Then you can see right there, it's just written in five notes uh, in the in the one beat. So you could just choose like your, so if I wanted to do this, so set your quantized value, you can say, okay, I want five notes and a half note. And now it's gonna put five notes in two beats. So that's how you could do different uh, tuplets. So go, set your quantized value and then you could just put it into step quantize and then as you enter it in, so if you wanna put in septuplets or 11 tuplets, whatever you want, you could just kind of put that in right there and that should be a pretty easy way to do that. Okay, question, does a lower buffer size mean better quality? No, um, a lower buffer size gives you more responsive performance, like when you're playing in virtual instruments or you're recording and you're monitoring through, the, bu the lower buffer size minimizes that delay, but it doesn't affect your quality. So often people, if their projects have grown, um, may need to increase the buffer size for it not to have crackles and pops and for the computer to be working too hard. But it doesn't affect the quality of the audio or of anything. It could affect the quality of the user experience where you may have to raise it, but it, your project doesn't get better when it's running a lower buffer. Okay, so we have a question uh, from Pylon Records. Uh, Under preference for Media Bay, I have chosen Scan Media Bay for folders, which shows everything. After saving and quitting, once again, the audio in folders does not show. Why? So it could be, uh, I would check this preference here. So when you go to Media Bay, I would check... Um, to make sure that your that scan folders only when Media Bay is open is unchecked. Uh, otherwise, it's only going to do. Sometimes Media Bay can be scanning in the background while you're doing other tasks. Uh, but if this is open, if that preference is checked, it's only going to scan the folders while you're in Media Bay. So if you're in Media, Media Bay for 10 or 15 seconds, you exit, it's gonna stop scanning and building its database. And at that point, you open it again, it starts all over again, where it may take, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, depending on if you have like, you know, hundreds of thousands of samples. Uh, so make sure that that is unchecked and that will probably help.
All right, so we see uh, from Bever Records. Hi, Greg, or Beaver Records. I just wanted to let you know they have a lot of your information greats from Pascal and Holland. So thanks for joining the live stream. Thanks for the kind words. Okay, we have a question from uh, Robbie Bowling. I've just recently set the project folder to save and copy all of the audio files. However, uh, is that a prompt I need to do with every session or will it do it automatically? Um, so if you, that, that preference, um, so I'll just make sure, so we go to the preferences under editing audio. Uh, so we have copy to all project. So this will stick, your preferences will stick and it won't be tied to a particular project. So if that setting is selected, um, that will stick until you change it. So, so it, it should do it automatically for you. Okay, so we have uh, from Jan a question, uh, buffer size change. When changing buffer size uh, in Cubase, it happens things with Chrome Edge, Firefox, for example, playing YouTube. Have you seen this before? Focusrite sound card. Um, so usually the, uh, you know, changing the buffer size, it may, you know, it may have to do, depending on the audio interface, it may have to do a little, it may kind of reset the audio interface, but everything should play back. Usually when that, when there's any interruption is if there's a, if the interface has to change sample rates between like a web browser. Um, but I haven't really seen, I, I've seen issues where sometimes not from changing the buffer size, but maybe changing the sample rate and you go back and forth. Like I had an audio interface, you know, probably in the 90s, late 90s, early 2000s of the Aardvark Q10, which I really liked at the time. And that would play back, you know, it was an audio interface that could play back 32K sample rates and some of the Windows system sounds were 32K. And if you got like a Windows system beep, it could switch the sample rate. Um, so I've seen that, but not from the buffer size. I've seen that kind of with sample rates uh, change. All right, so I see a question from Sable Winters. Where can I find the Beatles and or Stone song? Have searched both to no avail. So I'm not sure if it was ever released. Um, so a lot of times I, when I'm looking for demo projects, I can use, if I'm using something that's been released, I'll get kind of flagged on YouTube. Uh, and then, you know, they'll take down all of my live streams. So I try not to do that. So I don't think that that song was released. I think it's a wonderful song. You know, my friend Vince Melmed was one of the writers on it. And he's an incredible writer. Um, so I'll, I'll pass it along to him that you're looking for it and see if it was released in uh, another format. You know, I've had some of his songs that he's provided and they became like big hits in Nashville and I couldn't use them anymore and live streams and stuff. So, uh, so I, there's a couple of really good, he has a, a whole amazing set of, you know, he's, he's a really wonderful writer and a great kind of journeyman keyboard player. Uh, but I'm not sure if it was ever actually released, but I'll see if I could find out and have an answer for you for next week. Okay, question from Ace Amadeus. Uh, how do I back up my Groove Agent customized settings and VSTs, et cetera, to portable drive? Thanks. So anytime that you come to, let's say if we've built up uh, a kit, 
Um, I'll just make one here quickly. Okay, so let's say I'll just, here's my audio files. All right, so those are my fantasy audio files and now I want to go to Groove Agent. Uh, so as soon as you load up kits, um, so I'm just gonna right click here and cut the kit. I'm gonna take all of these little audio files, just audio files, and I'm gonna drag them onto the pads. So let's imagine this is these, and once you have this done, you, you could just export, right click on the agent itself and just export kit with samples. And then your destination, you could just choose, you know, your portable hard drive or wherever those files are, you can just come and copy those files. So, but you could, you know, just load it up and say export kit with samples and save it to your, like a USB flash drive. Okay, we have a question from Hector Santana B. Uh, if I want to do a filter automation, then I want to copy and paste it to another track. How can I do it? Okay, so let's say I go to Retrolog here. And I'm playing along, I'll just automate this. So I'll just say, okay, here's our filter cutoff. Okay. So it'll show up as an automation track. So if you just come here, um, so I'll see that we're gonna have our filter cut off. So if I wanted to copy this, I could just, um, just hit Command or Control C. And let's say if I wanted to open, I'll add an instrument track and I want it let's say pad shop and I wanted this for, you know, another automated parameter. I could just come here. So let's say I want to do this for volume and I could just paste it. And if you wanted to paste at the same time, I could hit control V and that will uh, paste the automation, um, you know, directly you know, to the track. Um, but let's say if I just want it so I'll just, let me just redo that here quickly. So I'm just gonna say, let's take this automation, copy. And then you could just paste it right into another tracks or another automation parameter. Okay, uh, so I just see from Ace, uh, Greg, on my earlier question, I'm backing up settings to portable drive. I just want to back up everything, but I still want to use my main hard drive SSD for real-time usage, thanks. You know, so pretty much like all your user settings, you know, you could back up from the profile manager, you know, and that will take care of a lot. And if you have like just custom samples, you know, you can move those wherever you want. And you know, just make a just open it up once in your file, and you know, go to your media bay and find it on your new computer, or whatever hard drive, and then you know, uh, Cubase will be able to recognize it. Okay, so from Millard Brown, um, question. Uh, Greg, for Cubase 11 Pro and Windows 10, lately I'm seeing some some spikes in CPU usage by a certain cycle-hungry VSTi. What are the best settings for maximum CPU performance, uh, Cubase and Windows? So, you know, there I would, you know, one of the things if it's, you know, running, you know, sometimes you may find that like one patch can really just, you know, decimate a CPU. 
because it's using, you know, incredibly advanced, you know, technologies, you know, so sometimes, you know, one patch could, you know, bring a CPU down to its knees. Uh, and if you, you know, duplicate that six times, you know, that can cause a lot of issues. So what if you are trying to, you know, just get it kind of functioning, you know, adjusting the buffer size is the, the first thing I would do raise that up i would make sure that you have activate multi-processing turned on you could try activating the asio guard that could also help um and on windows you'll probably see this little thing that says you know use steinberg power scheme uh, and we see this with a lot of computers especially laptops where the the cpu is throttled so that you could get longer battery life because to a laptop, um, that's a much bigger criteria than the CPU performance. So make sure that you have those things. And if it's still something that's just killing your CPU, you know, just, you know, choose to, you know, select the part and just render it as an audio file and disable the original track by right clicking. Then it's going to offload that process and you could just play back the audio file quite easily. Okay. All right, so I just see a comment from uh, Graham. Uh, tempo manipulation, wow, thanks, Greg. And Michael Teams indicating I'm La Leche. Okay, uh, so question, is there a way to save all of my settings in a MIDI edit window? For example, show all controllers, scroll is on, et cetera. So, you know, the project will stick to the particular values that you have. Um, and, you know, so we could, you know, at this point, if you wanted to, you know, so what a lot of people end up doing is kind of starting from a template where all of those things are preserved, but it, they will be stored within a particular song. And if you wanted to have, you know, different uh, controller lane presets, uh, like, you know, you could just come over here and see different, you know, controller lane presets that you want so that you could store that within your template as, as you want to see as well. But all those are just going to be stored directly within your particular project. Um, so, but the, so if you want it to always be preserved, you know, start store it within a template, and that's what most people would do. Okay, so we see from Jeff Pearson, just upgraded from 8.5 Artist the other week, but now there's a new promotion uh, where I could have saved 150. What can be done about this? So you could try to send an email to, if you got it from the Steinberg online shop. Um, sometimes if you send an email, say, oh, I love Steinberg. I, I attend all the Club Cubase live streams. I love this. And I was wondering if I could take advantage of this, you know. Um, I, I can't say that they'll do it, but it's worth a try to send them and, you know, tell them that you could spend the money on some other Steinberg products or something like that. Uh, it's worth writing a letter or sending a letter to the online shop or to your local Steinberg distributor to ask. Can't hurt. Okay, just okay. Let's just um, all right. Reading through all the questions. Thank you for all the wonderful questions. Um, Okay, so from Filter Free question, is there a way with the latest version of the download manager to download the software without installing? Um, I think, you know, most people seem to like 
that you know there's a lot of people when we kind of switched to the version 11 that you know complained that it didn't install for them automatically uh but if you go to like the steinberg website and download from from there uh, there's, I think there's just straight download links. So if you go to Cubase 11, let's see if we could find it quickly here. So I think if you just kind of go here to the Cubase 11 downloads that you could um, just download everything. But I think that the download assistant may just automatically install it for you to simplify the process. All right, we see Agent K is on the case, sending out the appropriate links. Thank you so much, Agent K. Um, okay, so I see, hi, Greg. Uh, how could I listen to the main song without effects I applied on Media Bay in the main tab of the control room, as you mentioned? I want to listen uh, main song and Media Bay wave loops with effects at the same time. So you, if you have headphones set up, I think you could, here's something to try. So let's say if you have your headphones set up, go to the preferences and go to control room. And so you could you could choose to have the headphones channel, the phone channel as the preview channel. So maybe you have the regular tracks playing through the speakers. And if you wanted to preview different loops, you could use the headphones channel, but you may need to come up to the audio connections into control room and just add a phones channel. So that, that way you could preview through the headphones and not preview through the um, and not preview through the speakers. So you, maybe that would work for you. Okay, so we just see, uh, all right, so we see Pablo just is done with his coffee. So now I want my mocha. And I have an hour and 11 minutes before I get my mocha. All right, so uh, so we just see a question. Uh, um, so how can I transfer from the sampler to the A track line? Greeting from Pascal from Holland. So if we have a sampler track, so let's say... Um, let's say I just have a loop here and so let's say I want to make this into a sampler track so I could create a sampler track like this. And then if I wanted to just, you know, trigger that with a note, you know, at this point I could just, you know, trigger the the particular sampler track. Um, so, so I see, how can I transfer from sampler to the A track line greeting? So, you know, and then once this is, so, you know, it's just gonna be MIDI information that triggers the sampler track. Um, but if I'm misunderstanding Pascal, just uh, let me know um, and, you know, I, think I might be misunderstanding but you know and, if, and then if you wanted to turn that into audio that you've done you could just choose to do a uh, render in place so you could just say okay I just want to take that and render that and turn that into an audio file again that's manipulated through the sampler track that was then triggered um, from 
a sample through the sampler track in MIDI, and then you could re-render it if you want to. Okay, so we have a question. How can we navigate between tracks inside the editor window? So let's go ahead and uh, just do a quick show particular file here. Okay, so if we have multiple tracks selected and I'm not sure if this is for MIDI or audio I'm going to assume it's MIDI um, but if I have multiple tracks selected so let's say I want violins one I want violins and violas so I could just select these events and I'm going to hit control E and now I could see all of the different parts here. Uh, I could choose to colorize by part so that each of the parts will be a different color. And then when we click here, I can now navigate to make one of these the active part that I'm editing. So this way you could just have that part uh, become the active and you could see it kind of highlighted in against the more demurred uh, inactive parts, but just kind of click here and all the actively selected parts. Now, if it's an audio file, um, there's also a way to do this. I'll probably forget how to do it, but bear with me just for a second. So let's say if I want to come to like my kick and hi-hat and I hit control E that we could in the sample editor we could switch between okay now I'm editing my snare track uh, which is kind of the purple violet rose and I could go to my sub kick track which is going to be yellow so we could see the two different parts against each other for audio so again select them before you go into the editor and then you could just kind of toggle back and forth. So you could use one as a reference point against the other track for different rhythmic editing. All right, my chat field just kind of jumped on me. Just bear with me. Um, okay, so a uh, question from Pear. Um, I had problems playing samples in the media tab. Turning off control room fixed it, but is there a different fix? Like right now I have it set probably to go through my uh, control room. So let's say if I jump over here to my media bay, I'm not going to uh, hear you know, because it's, I have this particular preference on in the control room. So if you have the phones that are set and make sure that you have like this uh, autoplay. So now you should be able to kind of hear directly there. So I would check that particular preference and make sure that the autoplay, uh, this little icon is, is ticked in the media bay and see if that helps. Okay, uh, so we have a question. Uh, Cubase does only save the Apollo's Twin X stereo input. If I select mono input left channel, next project, mono is gone, stereo is there. How to save that mono input for all projects. Okay, so I think this would work the same way in any audio interface. Let's say I have my stereo in and I have this connected. 
All right, and I want to add a bus, let's say two mono buses. Okay, so I want this to be in one and in two. So now I'm gonna save this as a preset. So I will just come right over here, click on save preset, and I'll just say Tom Gad. So now I can say, okay, we're gonna have one stereo input and then I could just call up that preset and everything is gonna be stored there. And that's gonna be kind of independent of the project. So at kind of the Cubase level. So try just saving it as a preset and see if that will recall the settings for you, Tom. All right, so I have a question, how to lock MIDI note event. Okay, so let's say if I'm here and I, you know, you could just come directly here if you wanted to uh, lock the MIDI notes here. You could select the event on the project window and just choose to lock the position. So now as I try to move it, it won't allow me to move it. So it'll just kind of be locked to that position. So it's gonna be select the event on a project window and just go to lock and go to position. Okay, so I just see a comment from Juan. Is it just me or is the video quality of the feed went way down? Everything looks unfocused. Uh, so sometimes refreshing your web browser can help. Often kind of when you see it, it's more, uh, I, I kind of monitor it here as I'm doing the presentation. Everything looks kind of fine, but obviously I'm close to the source. Uh, but, you know, it seems like, uh, so let me, you know, sometimes just doing uh, a refresh can help. Okay, so we have a question from Saturn's Outer Ring. How do you keep all this in your head, Greg? Um, so I think I'm just an idiot savant. So, you know, when I when I got Cubase, it just kind of made sense to me. So, um, so, but, you know, and I, you know, this is kind of what I do full time is just sit here and answer questions for people and help people with their Cubase. So, um, so, but thank you for the kind words, so. Doesn't impress my wife though. Okay, so we just see uh, from Gareth. Um, so question, Greg, I'm constantly losing settings and presets. Don't know if it's just me. So, you know, make sure, you know, if you could let me know if there's particular settings that you're losing or presets, but a lot of times it could be, you know, if you're using, if you're losing synth presets, or if you're losing plugin presets. So sometimes, um, you know, going into, if you save like, you know, track presets, stuff like that, going into the media bay, you know, make sure that you have it not to just look, but if you come here and go to user content is make sure that, you know, your user content is checked um, and you know, you should be able to kind of see the different, like, you know, the track presets and stuff that you've done here. So I'll show all files. So, you know, even if I want to go to, you know, track presets, like here's the one we made today. So, you know, but if it's, you know, make sure that your user content is checked in the media bay. So. All right, so we have Tron checking in from Norway. Thanks for joining us. Okay, uh, so we have a question. Hey, Greg, uh, Athens here. Please tell me, tell us about touch mode in the automation panel and the whole thing. Okay, so let's say if I have uh, automation going on, there's different automation modes. So let's say if I select 
touch mode. And we can think of touch mode as being like actually touching a fader. Okay, so when I go to write some automation in, so I'll open up just my automation lane so we could see the results as I write it in. So I'll play this and when we're in touch mode and we could switch between different automation modes as we just kind of want to click here. So you have a, an automation panel, but you could switch and it'll default to touch mode. So as I play, it's only gonna automate when I touch the fader. So I, it helps if I put it into right. It's always helpful. So I'm gonna put it into right. So it's not gonna record automation when I'm not touching the control surface fader or I'm not touching the fader with the mouse. So I come here, I move it, I let go, it stops writing the automation until I touch again. So if I come here, so as soon as I let go of the mouse, it stops writing the automation and it'll continue pre-existing automation. Now, when we go to auto latch mode, it will continue to write when I let go of the mouse and maintain that value until we stop. So let's say if I'm here and I'm finding the value, I can say, okay, we're just gonna let it go. I released my, from touching the fader. Now when I stop, then it's going to stop writing automation at that point. And that's what auto latch is. Now what crossover allows us to do is if we go below this value, we could have the automation kind of kick out as soon as we reach the existing threshold. So I'll come, so say I'm here and now I'm in crossover. Now as soon as I cross, go to the top there, that's when it's going to kick out of automation. So most people will just do touch mode and just think of it, I touch, I automate, I, I let go of the fader, it stops automating, so. All right, great to see you pro wash DFW on. Okay, so we have a question from Pear. Is there a linear phase option in the frequency plugin? So let's go ahead and take a look at it. So we'll come right over here. Let's go to our EQ to the frequency plugin. So yeah, each band, you could just click on the LIN here in the upper left-hand corner for each band and that will ensure the linear phase uh, aspect. So you could have it in non-linear phase or in linear phase just by clicking in the upper left-hand corner. Okay, um, so we see, hello Greg, how convert audio song to MIDI? Thanks from Serbia. So, you know, there isn't really a, you know, convert song to MIDI functionality. I don't think in really, you know, anything, but we can take like a vocal file. You know, if we had a vocal file here in very audio, um, so yeah, I could do like drum stuff where I could do it based on like when hits come in, but we could also just come here and say, okay, under functions in the very audio for like a monophonic part, like a single voice part. And at this point we could turn that into MIDI, but it's not taking a whole song where you just drop in an MP3 file and it's going to magically split everything. So we could do some aspects of that with, um, you know, spectral layers. So, you know, but it's not gonna turn it into MIDI, but if you wanted to kind of unbake the cake, you know. All right, sorry, my audio interface is not cooperating here. Let me just check my control room, see if it's, Okay, so, but, you know, spectral layers can split different instruments out for you, but it's not necessarily gonna turn it into MIDI data. So let me try this project again, see if my audio interface is gonna cooperate. I don't know why it started. Okay. All 
Okay, uh, Cubase is undoubtedly the leader, but too academic and heavy-handed. Daw, I think it's time to add a system of blocks for the four main tools. Well, I think if you asked, you know, 10 people what the four main tools are, they would probably give you 10 different answers. But the thing of Cubase that you have to realize is while it does a tremendous amount of things, uh, and it could do almost, you know, if, if a program, you know, if there's a, you know, Craig Anderton had a, you know, told me a great quote with Cubase. And he's like, you know, if there's any program that can do it, it's Cubase. And Cubase could do it all better than anything. But it doesn't mean that since it has like four or five ways to accomplish the same task that you have to use all of them. You could treat Cubase very simply and work incredibly fast and use the keyboard shortcuts. And you don't have to be encumbered by all of the options that are there. You know, probably the fastest user I've ever seen run Cubase is Stevie Wonder. And it's because he's blind and he's using keyboard shortcuts and he could write songs and he could get around his Cubase faster than anyone. So, you know, just because it does a lot doesn't mean that you have to use all those features. And those features aren't just pounding in your way as a creative hindrance either. Okay, so to see from uh, Pylon Records, Greg Defile Browser Media Bay, which accesses my internal drive with loads of audio, does not show all audio files, but a check into preferences Media Bay. Uh, it does, but disappears again, relaunch. So, you know, check to make sure that you're not doing that. And it's also a lot of times when I get questions like this, it's because people are saying, I'm looking for a base, um, you know, like I'm looking for an audio file um, in this particular folder. So let's say I go to documents. Um, so, you know, here's all of my audio files and I want it, you know, it could be okay. I'm looking in, I have Excel selected and I don't have audio files there or it's you know like i had someone who once was looking for a heavy metal accordion preset for a synthesizer and that's what his filters were set um just accidentally and he didn't realize that they would set up filter conditions that were really kind of almost impossible to meet so but you know just go through and make sure all the folders are there and give it time to scan through all the different folders for you Uh, so question, is there a difference in performance between the different versions of Halion? You know, I think that the performance is going to be the same because uh, in essence, what we see, I think even Retrolog and Pad Shop are, are based upon the Halion engine. Halion Sonic is just a different presentation of Halion. Halion Sonic SE is a different presentation of Halion, but the underlying technology and engine is all based on Halion. Right, just reading through comments. So I just see trying to make a piano cover of one of my friend's songs. I don't know where to start. You know, so depending, you know, so if you have the song, I would load it in as an audio file. And then, you know, you could just, if you're trying to learn how to do the chords, you know, just kind of play a little part and say, oh, what chord is that? And, you know, have a MIDI track, you know, your piano, and just try to see if you could just you know, have that automatically, you know, and find the chords as you play along with it. Okay, so we have a question from Mark. Uh, Hi, Greg, is there some easy way to back up my Cubase project automatically on the second disk? I had a disk crash and I lost all my data. Could it be done in an automatic way somehow? Thank you, Mark. So Cubase doesn't have a function for that. Um, 
But I know that there are different backup systems where you say, you know, back up this folder every night or back up this folder every three hours to a different drive. So there are lots of tools and utilities that are designed for that that are not party key based, but just kind of different backup schemes where you could keep, you know, this folder always synced in backup with another folder on an external drive just for archival purposes. All right, so we have a question from uh, Erica Music or Erka Music. I heard that Cubase will remove the e-licensor. Is it true? Yes. Yeah, so Steinberg has announced a couple months ago that they will be transitioning to a new license management system that is not going to require the USB e-licensor. So it will be, I think, months before it comes, but they're just kind of letting everyone, giving everyone a heads up that they are transitioning to a new license management system. All right, so we have a question. How would you compare the orchestral instruments included in Howlian 6 to the ones in Iconica? And how much does Iconica tax the CPU considering getting it? So I think Iconica is a really dedicated tool. I mean, you know, it was a very exhaustive sampling session we did in conjunction with uh, orchestral tools. And they did it at the, at, you know, the Funk House, I believe it's called, in Berlin. So... You know, it is, and that will give you all of the different articulations, all of the round robins, you know, and it's a, it's a massive project. Uh, and it is pretty stunning what you could do with the different layers and bringing in the, you know, different mic positions. Um, so a lot of stuff that's very kind of, you know, deemed as very, you know, where you have to spend a lot of time to make natural variations is done very easily. And all of the articulations are automatically mapped directly into Cubase. So you don't have to sit there and make, you know, all sorts of, you know, loads and loads of articulation maps and expression maps. Um, so, you know, check out the trial and play with it. And, you know, there may be promotions coming on for it at different times of the year. And, you know, but, you know, try the trial version. I think, you know, what you get with Halion is, you know, very good quality. You know, the content is really wonderful, but it's not really, you know, going to replace an orchestra, a dedicated orchestral, you know, library tool. Okay, reading through comments. Thanks for all the great questions. And if you've learned something new, make sure you hit the like button and also that you uh, have subscribed to the channel so you get notified of future hangouts and live streams. Okay, so we have a question. Hi, is it possible to group tracks in arrangement view or is it only possible from the mixer, uh, audio routing? So yeah, you could definitely do it from, um, so if you wanna do audio routing, so let's just jump. Okay, so if I wanted all of these tracks to be sent, you know, to, um, you know, so if I wanted to send all these to, all these tracks to a bus, I could just add group channel to the selected channels. Um, and now all those tracks are routed to the group. Um, also, if I come here, and 
let's say I go to my mix console view and I want to go to my inserts and I wanted to enable quick link and you can do this by holding alt or option plus shift. So if I wanted to say, okay, I needed a particular, I want to put Magneto on every one of the tracks. I could go to distortion here and enable quick link and just put Magneto and that would automatically open across all my tracks, you know, so we could do that in the mix console or on the project window. All right, so according to Michael Teams, we all know now that Pablo is famous, so. It's good to know. All right, great to see that Mark Rabin was able to make it. I'll get my mocha afterwards. So I have to do some work after this and then do the do the index and then I could have my my weekend starts late tonight. Okay. Um Okay, sorry, my chat field jumped on me. Okay, so I have a question. I have a light color scheme, but can't see automation, effects line, etc. Can I change the color of the line? Okay, so let's say if I have automation going on here. Okay, so I have that and let's switch my color scheme to be brighter. So I think that one, you know, you may, so here I could see the contrast to it, but you know, and also as you hover, you should see all kind of the dots so let me know, I mean, that seems, you know, like definitely kind of workable for editing the automation. Um, so, I mean, I do see the contrast error, but let me know if, if yours looks different. And I'll just go ahead and jump back. Okay, so I just see question, does anyone know when the Dorco will be updated to Dorco 4? So I'm sure that the team, I just had a meeting with uh, Daniel and John Barron last week, so I know that they're busy on a lot of great stuff, so um, I'm sure they'll show it when it's all ready. Okay, so I just see a question. How do you set an individual output for each individual MIDI track? Um, so if it's a MIDI track, um, you know, we could come here. So let's say we have our MIDI track. So you could see your output set here. Um, if it is gonna be, I'm not sure if it's a audio output. So let's say if I wanted to go to uh, say a new project here and I have an instrument track. So let's say a multi-timbral one, let's say like Howling Sonic SE. Uh, and then when we go to, um, let's say our mix, um, I could see, so I'm not sure if it's an audio output, uh, but as I add, a number of MIDI tracks here. If this is selected, it will automatically 
populate this. And then when you have different instruments loaded up, if it's, when you say individual output, so, you know, the MIDI isn't going to have the output, but it, the instrument itself is where you could set the outputs itself or the instrument track, but it would be done kind of in the instrument, depending on uh, what MIDI channel is being sent to the instrument and the instrument can then route that out route that channel to, to its own independent output. Okay, so we have a question from Thomas Mullen. I'm currently looking at purchasing one of the Cubase versions, but have no idea what the different uh, versions are for or even do. Could you explain the main differences between the versions? Um, so, you know, the three main commercial versions, you have kind of an entry level of a Cubase elements. I believe it's 48 tracks. It's not going to offer surround sound. It's not going to offer as many plugins or capabilities. But if you're just kind of starting, a lot of people can do all of their projects in Cubase elements. When you want to do stuff like, okay, I need more plugins. I need more channels. I need more groups. I need to do kind of graphic editing of pitch. Um, I need more instrument sounds. That's when you have Cubase Artist. If you wanted to you have kind of the full enchilada in the Cubase range, you have uh, Cubase Pro, and that would give you, you know, surround sound, more advanced notation, more instruments, more sounds and loops, you know, basically unlimited tracks. So, you know, and those are kind of priced accordingly. You know, I'm not sure where you live, so I won't give prices that are specific to a particular country. Uh, but you know, you could, you know, you know, if you wanted to do, you know, a, an Oscar winning film, you know, those have been done in Cubase the last, you know, several years. So in, in Cubase pro, you know, so you could figure out kind of, you know, maybe where your level of investment is. You could try a Cubase elements trial, uh, and see if that is kind of meeting your needs. Uh, if you need more, you could purchase an e-licensor. And then if you wanted to try a Cubase Pro trial version, you could experience kind of all the differences for 30 days each and see which one kind of makes sense for your workflow. But if you could indicate you know, like what type of projects you're doing, uh, you know, if it's like I'm recording, you know, my guitar with some drum samples, a bass and a vocal, you know, Cubase elements may work for you. And that may be all the investment that you need to make. But if you're like, OK, I need to do a full film score for a broadcast TV show and I need to record a band uh, where the drummer isn't so good and the vocalists aren't so great, then maybe Cubase Pro can make sense for you. So maybe, Thomas, if you could share some of the different uh and on the website you can see pretty detailed comparisons between you know the elements artist and pro okay so and a further question uh from thomas and if i download an individual amp simulator will it still run inside of cubase and if so how do i access it so you know cubase in steinberg uh, the company that makes Cubase, we invented the VST plugin format. So if it's a VST plugin, which most uh, audio plugins are going to be VST based, uh, but you could now just, if you have an audio track, all you have to do is go to like an insert and you'll see all of your different plugins that are available to you. So if you say, okay, I want to go under distortion, you should see it listed here in your plugin. And you can say, oh, I just wanted to run the VST amp rack. And now you could just, you know, have, you could see all of your different um, plugins. But if it's just a standalone program, um, that probably won't work with Cubase. But if you're, most of them would come in a plugin format. So you could run it with a DAW uh, program like Cubase. And then you should be all set to just open it up right there.
see Gary says my wife can't appreciate it because I'm a secret superhero. So as long as I take the trash out, I, I'm okay. All right, so we see Venus Darius just saying about time I caught one of these live. Okay, so I know we had some uh, questions that were mailed in. Let's get to those. I know we had a good number of them this week, so let's get through them. Okay. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. Okay, so we had a question. Uh, is it possible to sequence the bypass of an insert effect in the same way you can sequence loop mash effects? with Step Designer on a MIDI track. Uh, I've tried using the generic remote to assign a note to bypass an effect, but can't seem to get it to work. The overall goal is to build something like Sugar Bites' Looperator within Cubase. Uh, and this question from Chris. So let's say if I go to my master fader here and I just want it to, uh, I'm gonna have a compressor and Let's say a doo -doo -doo, let's say a flanger or something, and I wanted these to automatically bypass from hitting a keyboard shortcut. So let's say okay. So I have these as effects on my master bus. So what I want to do is to go into my. Uh, I'll go into my studio setup and let's go to a generic remote. Um, so we could say note on, and what I'm gonna do is just capture my MIDI note message. So I'm just gonna hit a key on my MIDI keyboard and that's gonna just cover, it's gonna trigger, capture that MIDI note. All right, so I'll come here, get trigger that and as we, want to come over here. So I'm gonna say, let's go to the mixer. And let's say I wanted to go to um, stereo out. And I wanted to go to insert one, let's say the compressor, and I'm just gonna choose bypass. So, and then I want this MIDI note to go to the mixer on our stereo out. And I want to go to flanger to bypass. So we'll come over here. So now I have, I can see these two plugins open and I hit the MIDI note. It's just going to bypass that particular note. So when I hit the note, it turns the compressor off. I let go of the note, the compressor is turned back on. I hit the note for the flanger and then it's automatically uh, turned on and off. So once again, go to your studio setup here and set the MIDI note message, choose mixer, the channel, which is probably gonna be your stereo out and inserts. And you'll see the different inserts listed here and choose bypass. Uh, and then once you do that, that MIDI note message will just turn it off. Okay, question. Uh, I have a feature request I would like to run by you. Uh, in the plugin manager window, I would like to have a new column added for display name where we could double click and enter a tag for each plugin and then an option preference to toggle between show plugin names and show plugin display names. Uh, this would toggle between the two display modes in the right pane, folder view of the plugin manager, and also in the mixer consoles and inspector views of the project. Uh, would this be possible? It has long bugged me that I cannot uh, standardize the syntax and capitalization of plugin names. I assume they are hard coded by the plugin developers. Uh, if you think this has merit, might it be possible for you to please pa pass it along to the team? So, I'll, and this is from Ian Rushmore. So, I'll definitely pass it along. Uh, so, I'm not sure if it's possible or impossible. So, I know some people on some plugins, and it seems to work with some plugins and not with others but can actually go in like into the plugin itself, like in Windows. And I've seen more people try it on Windows where you just, you know, because the plugin is a .dll file where people will go ahead and just rename the .dll file. 
Um, so sometimes that works for people. Um, but I, I kind of like the idea of having an option to a user create it since we can put it into different folders, but I'm not sure I'm not a software developer. I'm not that smart a guy. Um, if that is hard coded into the VST specification and I realize it could be frustrating with, you know, different manufacturers with different naming conventions, but I'll definitely kind of pass that along. Okay, let me just open up a project for our next uh, question. All right, so we have a question here. Uh, very often we do a render in place of a VSTi to save RAM. Uh, now after done many parts and thus transforming them into audio, it becomes tough to do tempo changes afterwards since the elastic audio warping is not always pleasant to the ear, especially with orchestral sounds. Now once the tempo track is written with all the slowdowns, it becomes tough to play new parts because it doesn't no longer match uh, bar and beat grids. So here's my question. Uh, can you showcase a three track arrangement with classical instruments or any other and show when to do tempo changes before or after the render in place and how to keep the bars and beats grid still aligned to facilitate writing new counter melodies? Okay, so I kind of have that here. So I'll just go ahead and uh, I'll activate this project. So I would try to keep everything and let me, I'll just go ahead and delete my audio tracks on this particular project. Okay, so I will remove those selected tracks and I'm going to enable these tracks. I put created my wonderful orchestral score like 10 minutes before the live stream started here. So I'm gonna enable all the tracks. So let's say I just have, you know, something. All right, and let's say I wanted to now just kind of come over here and just put in some tempo changes. So if I just wanted this to kind of speed up and slow down. So what I would do is if you, I would do all of my tempo adjustments before rendering, okay? And if I chose to do, if I needed after, if I've done tempo changes after, what I would do is select the tracks and I would choose to come directly here and I would just say, let's go to uh, our render in place. And I'm gonna say, let's render with current settings or so I'll just go to my render settings and I'll just say, okay, we'll just do our channel settings here. And I'm going to choose to just to disable the source tracks. Okay. So what this is going to do is turn off, you know, especially if you have a large orchestral thing, this will automatically just, you know, render those as audio. So, and as we kind of work with the, you know, I'll just not have these record enabled and I'll just render in place again. So this way, once we have, um, you know, everything kind of set, you know, so try to make all the tempo changes ahead of time. And then, you know, once you look at it, what you're going to be able to do is, you know, if we needed to do more tempo changes is just, you know, get rid of those files, you know, because you're going to have a lot more accuracy and these tracks that are disabled, aren't taking any Ram, aren't taking any CPU and just enable the tracks and then just say, oh, I need that to be faster and do a tempo change here and there, and then just re-render. So that way your, your original tracks will always, your MIDI tracks will always be there if you needed to change it afterwards. That's what I would do. Okay. Okay, so Chris St. Aubin, who, has done, uh, who runs the Cubase users 
uh, Facebook group and also the um, it's created uh, Simple, which is a wonderful instrument. Um, he wanted to know how to create a device panel from scratch. All right, so I'm going to come here. Um, and if you're not familiar with device panels, what you could do is for external instruments, external MIDI devices, you could create a device panel. So I'm going to go over here. Uh, I'll go to studio to more options to my MIDI device manager. I'm going to go ahead and remove this and we're going to build one from scratch. So I'm going to install a device and you have a number of devices here, but let's say I, I just want to define a new device. I'm going to give it a name. So we'll call it Chris in honor of Chris St. Hobbin. Wonderful guy. And I'm going to now hit OK. I'm going to tell it to go out to my MIDI device that I want to control is going out to this particular MIDI port. I click on open device and I get this blank screen. So now when I click on uh, edit, what I could do is I'm going to just click on the name of the device and we're going to click on add panel. Now there's three general sizes. So there's a general one for inspector and one for the channel strip. So I'm going to make this for the inspector. I'm going to hit OK. So what we want to do is we could add different elements. So if I wanted to add a background, faders, knobs, data entry, switches, labels. So let's say I want to do something like I want to add uh, resonance and cutoff and volume and panning. So I'm going to go to fader and I'm just going to drag my fader over. I'm going to build basically a quick software interface. I'm going to drag it over. Now, one thing that's really easy to do is not to hit create. So don't hit OK yet. Hit create. And what I want this to do is to control the parameter. This will be for volume. And I'm going to set the CC message here. And we could also put sysx data in. And I'm going to just give this a quick double click on the title and we'll call it volume. Okay, so now I want it to do a knob. So, and let's say I wanted this knob to go here. I'm going to create and we'll make this panning. Okay, and we're going to make this MIDI CC. 10 for pan. Okay, and let's go ahead and click on the title. Okay, so I wanted to create a, another knob. And I'll just kind of drop this in. And remember to click create. And I wanted this to be like, you know, filter or whatever. So I'm going to come to, um, Let's say, I think we're in the 70s. So let's say, okay, I want this to be brightness. Okay, so I'll just call this um, filter. Okay, so we hit okay. And so we could build kind of like your own little software editor. So let's say I want this to be, uh, you know, resonance or whatever. So I'll come over here, let's create. Always remember to hit create because otherwise you could kind of create multiple versions. And I wanted this to be, you know, control 71. So I will come here and say, okay, here's harmonic content. So we'll just call this resonance or whatever it is. And you may have to look up in your instrument what controls are actually controlling that. And let's add one that's a, uh, a reverb. So I will just come here, let's say for a general MIDI instrument. So as we come here, we'll just say this will be for our reverb send. Okay, so we'll name it. Okay, now when I go to my panning, let's say I want my panning to uh, have the default value in the middle. So I'm gonna put 63 for the default value. Okay, so now I'll close this and let's go ahead and save my panel. 
And so we've made a quick panel with some volume pan and we could now just open up when I add in a MIDI track, I will come over here and we're gonna route this out to our instrument, Chris, that we've made. And we can now just open up our device panel. If I did it right. All right, so and make sure that you have it on the right MIDI channel. And here's our device panel that we've made. And let's say if I really wanted to uh, clean that up a little bit, I'll show you a couple of other things that we could do. So let's go again to our MIDI device manager. Uh, let's open the device. And then I could do stuff like, okay, I wanna take these two. Um, I'm gonna select these two here and let's align uh, left on that. Let's align these two, right click, align the lefts. And I wanted these two to be aligned uh, tops. All right, so now I can come over here. We'll save that. So as soon as I, and then you could put different backgrounds or bitmap images, but now I could have this little editor. And if I go to my device panel, I could just click here and I could have control over my, my reverb, my, filters, resonance, whatever you want it to do. And as we have just some MIDI parts here, all I have to do is I will open up the device panel. We could automate this. And then I could adjust those particular parameters. So we could build your own kind of software editor for external MIDI devices. Now this could be switches, it could be MIDI lights, it could be, you know, console changes, MIDI program changes. So whatever MIDI SysX data, whatever information that you want, you're able to kind of manipulate uh, directly there and have your editor. And this could also show up directly right here. So you know, every time that you go to this, to this synth, you want these parameters as your go-to parameters. So you could just automate. That's all you have to do is just simply come right there and you have complete control on doing a device panel. And again, you could even put different colored backgrounds, all sorts of stuff to build your own editors. Okay. Okay, so we have a question. Um, so my question for the Club Cubase live stream, how do I import an AAF file that contains stereo tracks? I always seem to end up with mono files only no matter what settings I use in Pro Tools or DaVinci Resolve for the export. Uh, I use Nuendo 11. So I'm pretty sure that the AAF doesn't actually support stereo files. It just supports kind of multi mono files. So, I think it's a limitation of the AAF specification that automatically splits your stereo files into mono. So I don't think there's much we could do about that, but you could take like, you know, multi mono tracks and just, you know, select them. If you're looking for an easy way, go to uh, your project and you'll see convert tracks. And then you could just say mono to multi-channel and you could do that for all the tracks if you wanted to, or just selected tracks to kind of speed up the process. But again, I think it's a limitation of the AAF specification. Um, okay, we covered that question. Um, okay, so right before the live stream, we had a question. Can you explain how to make her mode tuning work? It doesn't seem to do anything when I enable it and follow the instructions. So it could depend upon the playback instrument. And as we talked about earlier in the live stream of VST 3.5 instruments, being able to automatically, you know, have independent pitch shifting. So let's say if I wanted to come here, uh, I have a quick like orchestral example of her mode tuning. Where And what Hermo tuning is, if you're not familiar with it, and you could set this up in the project setup, uh, so you could have, you know, different Hermo tunings. 
Uh, you know, because our tuning system that we have that's most widely used is going to be based on uh, equal temperament. And that's kind of, you know, through physics, kind of a, a bit of a compromise. So, you know, and I've worked with people that are very adamant that will do just pure tuning. Um, so when I want to come here, let's say I have uh, equal temperament here, and I just took kind of chords as clarinet being routed out to orchestral instruments, and then I took the same parts and had it play back as her mode tuning. So we can get a sense when we switch between these two. So let's listen to equal temperament and listen to the tuning of the chords. And I kind of chose wind instruments because, you know, their their harmonic content can really expose different tuning anomalies. And if you notice that like really high quality or, or you know, string orchestras and choral groups, they always will navigate towards pure temperament. So let's take a listen to it here. So you hear some chords are just out of tune. So now I place these tracks into her mode tuning. Let's listen to these. And let's listen to both of them together to listen to the differences. So if it's not working for you, try running it through like a Halion Sonic SE because that will have support for all of the VST 3.5 where you could have the independent tuning on a note um, and see if that makes a difference for you. So, all right. Um, so we had a, another question. We had just kind of asked in a previous hangout about, you know, if Cubase utilizes the multi-core uh, processors when doing an export audio mix down the person felt like it wasn't necessarily doing that so I just created kind of a large uh, project here with a lot of strings with you know just copied multiple times where we just look at a particular lots of polyphony uh, so this is one part and this part will be copied um, you know, multiple times in multiple scenarios. Um, so we're going to play back, you know, hundreds of notes of polyphony. We'll just get the all the samples loaded up here. And so we noticed that when we actually do the export audio mix down, if I open up the activity monitor uh, on my Mac here, and let's say I'll just go to my CPU usage. And now when I will just unselect, um, so I'll just come here and let's solo all of our particular tracks here. Okay, so, and now what I want to do is a quick export of all of these files. So we can see that we can see our CPU usage here on my Mac. And let's go ahead and do an export audio mix down. So I will move this over here. I want to do just a quick stereo mix. So let's go ahead and I'll just add that to my queue. So we'll make it a 24 bit 48 K and let's start our queue export. Um, so as we do a number of different tracks, we can see the different CPU cores are kind of all being utilized for the process. 
So it looks like, you know, and depending on how the CPU is being, you know, how the instruments are being allocated, we could just see that, you know, the different CPU cores, you know, it's not one CPU core that's doing it. It's actually being split across all of the different CPU cores. Um, so it looks like, you know, despite, um, you know, what's going on that all the CPU cores are being utilized during the mix down process. All right, let me jump back to our live stream. I think we have, we're doing well on time. So let's see if there's, I'm sure I have more questions. Okay. Thanks for all the wonderful questions and we hope that everyone's learned something new. Okay, so I see uh, with Gareth is Gareth's clarification on the uh, settings he's losing. So it says he's kind of losing some of the settings uh, with track control settings and keyboard shortcuts. Uh, so he's just saying his settings reset and presets will disappear. So. Um, okay, I, I could do some research on that, Gareth, if you want to email me. Okay. Okay, so I I just see how can I copy CC mapping without the notes? Um, so if we have, you know, MIDI CC messages, let me just go to like a new project here. Give me a second, just have a huge project there. So let's come. Okay, so let's say if I just have, um, I'll just create two parts here. So, um, so it says, um, how can I copy CC mapping without the notes? So if you have CC data, so let's say this is gonna be um, modulation. And again, you could just select this and let's copy. So I'll just copy and then jump to my next part and then I get a modulation and then you could just paste. So let me know if that's what you wanna do but you could just copy and paste uh, the data between. All right, so we see touch mode was today's revelation for Gareth. Um, okay, we have a question. Is it possible to program the headphone output in a control room for a cross feed effect where the left channel hears a bit of the right channel and vice versa? Um, so I'm not sure what the cross feed effect is. Um, you know, so generally it's just gonna take your stereo out or your mono out and be able to listen. Um, but if you could let me know concert replay, maybe if you wanna email me, I know we're towards the end of the live stream, but if you wanna email me kind of what the purpose is, uh, I may be able to come up with something. Okay, so I see a question, what should be the kick and snare gain stage? How much dB should it be hitting? Thank you. So, you know, every mix and every project's gonna be different. So I think if you start thinking of, you know, my kick has to hit this amount of dB, my snare, it could be totally different for every song. So I, that's one of those things I would maybe take um, on a case by case basis.
Okay, so when using Vary Audio, how do I write the corrected vocal to a new track or bounce with the Vary Audio effect on it? So let's go take a look. Okay, let me just open up a quick project to show. Okay, so if you've done all sorts of wonderful very audio editing uh, and you wanted to apply all of the edits that you've done, kind of bounced hard into the file, all you have to do is go to functions and uh, flatten, select flatten real time processing. Then that all of those changes are kind of written into the file. All right, great to see Jeff Zabelski made it on the Hangout. Sorry, I wasn't able to say hi earlier. Hope you're doing well. All right, he's bragging that he added 114 markers in a project. All right. All right, great to see Venus Theory on the live stream. All right, uh, check the time. So we have maybe one more question before we have to wrap up. And once again, next week, we'll have a shorter live stream on Friday and we'll be doing the um, the Zoom meetup and I'll send a link next, uh, I'll include a link next Friday in the live stream. But if you wanna email me, I'll send you a link as well. Okay. All right, just reading through. See, there's a quick question I get. My chat field just jumped on me. Okay, so quick question. Is there a way of keeping the same tempo of MIDI after doubling or having the tempo of a project? So if you wanted to, if you had MIDI data and you wanted it to not be affected by the tempo, um, you could place it into linear mode right here. And then as you adjust the tempo, um, the MIDI would still play back uh, at the same time positions. So that's something you could do. Now, another thing that you could do is one of the logical editor presets is if you come over here, you could also try to, um, I think there's like a double length. Um, so you could choose to double tempo on the logical editor or do a half tempo. So you could set up logical editor presets for that. All right, so with that, we're out of time. I wanna thank everyone for all the wonderful questions. We'll see everyone on uh, the live stream on Tuesday. And you can send questions in advance to Club Cubase at steinberg.de. Want everyone to stay safe and healthy over the weekend and look forward to talking with everyone on the Zoom meetup next Friday. Have a wonderful weekend. Thanks for the great questions, and we'll talk to you then. Goodbye.